have seven o'clock on the dot. So we will call the July 18, 2022 uh, meeting of the select board to order. Um, Mike is not here today, so I will be doing my best to fill his shoes and run today's meeting. Um, so we'll start with approving the agenda. I'll move to approve the agenda. Second. Moved and seconded. Anything further? Additions or changes? All those in favor of approving agenda as presented? Aye. 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 So. And moving on to consent agenda items, minutes of the July 5th meeting and then errors and omissions, which we received via email from, um, from Carla, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll take a motion to approve consent agenda items. So moved, second. Move and second, any further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 So passes. Uh, now is the time for public comment, either from anyone in the room or via Zoom. And this is for anything that is not present on the agenda currently. And um, if there are folks who'd like to speak, we're going to try to keep it to about two minutes each, just to keep things uh, time. Yes, yeah. come on up, state your name, and then. Tom Scribner, capital policy question. Did my ability to make it out of the parking lot? For discussion. For what? Sorry. Liability was in the parking lot. Liability. However long. Did they ever make it for discussion? I don't. We've discussed insurance in general several yeah, okay. times. But. Okay. I'm just curious. Um, there's Mark is still mowing out there in the center. So the private citizen town facility, what is the town policy regarding private citizens maintaining the town facility? Well, we've let that happen in the case of the in the case of the park in question for a number of years. Um, you are aware of that we're in the process of uh, of a study uh, to identify what's going to happen and go forward in that park and in another park. And um, from my perspective, nothing changes until we finish all that work. Okay, so all that really means is that he has no insurance as he does this. Well, I'm not in, I'm not able to say that right now. Okay, and there's probably no actual agreement with the town in terms of his case. The time. agreement is what the select board agreed to years ago, okay. which you mentioned many times right but there's still a double standard there when you say to one person they have to have like really insurance and then another you send them up to do something okay. so just saying um okay so what about social media is that still in the parking lot yes yes so we just as an update i received recently a social media policy that was created for I believe it was the rec department. And then I've asked a couple of their towns for some examples of social media policies in other areas. I have not received those. So when I do, I'll send them out to the select board and then we'll go forward on having a conversation. Okay, because what's happening now is we're going back to the future in that David Frothingham is posting on Facebook about the steering committee activities. And I don't believe there's been announcements about the process for whatever through the town on the town site etc so i'm just curious is he speaking from the for the drb is he speaking for center change is he speaking for david frothingham that's where it gets confused we've already done this a year ago with board people mm -hmm. speaking out publicly but not saying who they're speaking for like bill we didn't hear one night you said well that was actually i was expressing my own opinion not that of the town manager so that's helpful when we do that um, the second part of that is on the steering committee. So David Frothingham is on the steering committee. He's also, as of 2022, he is a professional disc golfer. He has competed in close to 70 events. There's money involved. He has his own LLC for disc golf. That, you know, these tournaments at 100, 200 people, $50 a whack to get in. There's a lot of money being thrown around. 
And I don't think he's organizing those at this point, but the point is, at the time that the professional events and money entered the equation, that's when everything escalated, both in terms of numbers, destruction, activity, everything. So I think that with, um, there's definitely a conflict of interest there for him to be on the development uh, steering committee for. I didn't put him on there. Something. Keep looking at me. I didn't put him well, on there. You're the answer man in this group. Okay. You are. Hey, you're going to be solving this. You're on solving this. Okay. Um, but I'm just saying, we have, you know, a professional entity. Um, it's not like it's a, you know, nonprofit or some such thing. A professional disc golfer who makes money at disc golf involved in this decision making process on the steering committee. So that's a conflict of interest. Okay. So if you're calling me the answer man, then this is what I will say. And the select board are all here, two of whom weren't on the board when we put the, um, the planning study in place. Okay. So the issues that you're raising are issues that you've raised for a number of years now. And the select board has taken the position that the best way to address the issues that you're talking about is through the planning process that we're undertaking now. And that doesn't mean you have to like the fact that we haven't made any changes to our laissez-faire, um, uh, approach to this park right now. But from my perspective, the select board has recommended to the voters this study. The study has started. There's a steering committee. People applied. Um, they asked, they wanted stakeholders. So having somebody from the disc golf community on the steering committee shouldn't be a surprise to anybody because they're a stakeholder. So from my perspective, uh, in some ways, December can't get here fast enough, and not because I'm going out the door at the end of December, <laughs> but because that's when this study is going to be done. So I'm hopeful that we can all just be patient and live with what we've lived with for a number of years, and then we'll get some answers. And, you know, if that doesn't help you, Tom, that's fine. But from my perspective, that's where the town is. Okay, uh, one other issue related to that is so if he's negotiating with a Knowles property owner about things about town lands, which hat is he wearing? Is he wearing DRB? Is he wearing professional disc golf? Is he wearing center chains or is he wearing town resident? Well, except for you telling me right now that he may be negotiating with someone, I don't know because he's not, the town isn't in negotiation with anybody for any additional plan. So well, you, you don't want me to email you Bill. So you know I'm trying to keep it down for you. I'm trying to let you out the door, okay? Well, I, all, I'm, all I'm saying, Tom, is I, I you know he as a as a private citizen, he can talk to anybody about anything he wants. He can't represent the town, obviously. But nobody has called me to say, hey, there's somebody talking to me in the name of the town about. I have no knowledge of him negotiating with anybody except for what you just said right now. Well, going forward, if he's going to continue to present as a voice of the steering committee on Facebook, do you, do you think that's okay? Well, it's, I'm not sure it's up to me to think it's okay or not. It's his, it's his own Facebook page, right? It's not well, it's the center chain, whatever okay. it is. So I mean, it's a group that's not a group, but whatever. So the town doesn't control that. He's on a committee. If he wants to put something, you can't put anything on the town, you know, on the town's website. He can't speak in the name of the town, but if he's putting information on his own site, there's very little we can say about that, unfortunately. There's, there's plenty of sites out there, if it were up to me, that'd be heavily edited. You know? Well, I think he could go backwards to the people on the steering committee and have them be in a consensus and then release information as they feel is appropriate. Well, the steering committee's had one meeting, and there's <laughs> some members of the steering committee that are here tonight. I sat in the back of the room during the steering committee meeting for about 
15 minutes after another meeting and I'm not on the committee. So. Well, I, I think there should be one voice of credible information coming out of this thing. Thank I don't you. think that's a lot to ask. Do you have more? No, that's uh, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Carl. Is there anyone else either in Zoom or in the room that would like to speak on something that is not on the agenda for today? No other hand, we will move forward to select board items. Uh, and we're starting with a uh, guest from VLCT of Mont League of Cities and Towns, Ted Brady. Thank you so much. Yes. So, um, Welcome, Ted. And they're the select board, but <laughs> I've known Ted for a while. And I actually uh, reached out to him on behalf of the board to invite him to come. Uh, Ted's been the executive director of VLCT for two plus years now? A year. A year. That's okay. It. Wow. <laughs> Time goes faster than I thought or slower than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Ted's been with the league for about a year. and. In my estimation, I think Ted is really uh, uh, not necessarily the right person, but absolutely a right person for this job. And I'm, I'm happy the, the board hired him a, a year or so ago for this position because, as we all know, um, the Vermont town and municipal government is changing um, quickly, as is the rest of society. There are things that we're facing now that we haven't had to deal with in my 40 year career until the last few years. And Ted has lots of energy, has lots of ideas. And um, I know he's been trying to uh, reach out to select boards and city councils um, across the state. So I thought it'd be good if he had an opportunity to come here. And he actually had a two for him moderator. He has to <laughs> get the Talk to you, thing. Anyway, thanks for coming. So, thanks. I have uh, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, should I present? Will you? Will you be able to present? What's the preference? I have it too. If you, if you prefer. No, oh, it'd be great if you don't mind. So mm -hmm. I can focus on all of you. So the bill's way too generous, uh, but I love the fact that you qualified that I'm not the right person. I'm a right person. I'm going to use that one. It's very bill. I love it. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was just participating in uh, the new thing select board uh, meeting from the Red Room in the library. And I, it just is amazing when you folks have built here. What an incredible resource. I would say that this building is just about everything that is good about municipal government. So kudos to Waterbury for making this happen. Um, I'm trying to visit two select boards a month, so I've done my job in July. <laughs> all in one night. Hard to do when you all meet on Mondays. Uh, and I'm doing that because I am the new executive director of the league. And my goal here is not to run the same organization that's existed for 55 years. Because uh, government's changed quite a bit in those 55 years. Uh, we're still running an organization in municipal government that uh, was created by people that lived 250 years ago. So maybe we're really modern by only being 55 years late, but when we talk about some of the challenges facing you as select board members, we haven't given any new tools really uh, in those last 55 years. Uh, the fact that we're meeting hybrid uh, maybe is a direct contradiction of what I just said, but this tool goes away in a few months, right? Because the legislature is saying that we can't have hybrid meetings. Really? Or, sorry, all remote meetings, which yeah. uh, we can have, can have hybrid. Hybrid. Yes. Yeah. We can't have all yeah. remote meetings going forward. So things like that. It's just thinking about municipal government differently. But anyways, I have a few slides here. If you'll indulge me, I'm hoping seven to ten minutes. And then maybe uh, you can ask me a few questions if anything I say is relevant. And I have some calls to action in what I'm doing. So I'm not just here to tell you about the league. I'm here because there are some things I think Waterbury could do uh, with the league. That they're not doing that might help you. Uh, uh, in large part, we have new services. Uh, so, if you take me to the next slide, please, that'd be great. Just as a reminder for those of you that don't know, uh, the league uh, is owned by you. We are an instrumentality of government. Uh, we derive everything we have from you. You are our members. You pay us a membership fee every year. You are our board. You know, Bill has sat on every one of our boards multiple times. 
Uh, but we, we are owned by you. That makes us unique. We are the only thing in the state like us. And there's one of us in every state. Funny enough, we were the last one to be formed in the country. We were the last municipal league formed 55 years ago. Every town since about 1996 or 1994 has been a member. Every city and town has been a member. That makes us unique also. We're, you, you opt in to us. You don't just become a member. You pay your dues. As of July 1st, I'm proud to say we're growing. We are 247 cities and towns, thanks to the city yes. of Essex Junction, opting in to be our member. There's another 142 units of municipal government, some of them right here in Waterbury. They're also our members, but they're our associate members. They don't have the same privilege as you do, which you don't get to vote. They don't get to vote on our legislative policy. They don't get to decide who to hire as their executive director. That's reserved only for cities and towns. Our mission is up there. It's pretty clear. We're here to serve and strengthen you, local government. We do this in these five critical ways on the right-hand side. Uh, we support you by answering questions. We have four municipal attorneys uh, that run the inquiry service. You can email, you can call us. In the last five years, Waterbury's done that 50 times, so on average about 10 times. That means either Bill's called, one of you's called, your planning commission members have called. God knows, somebody who is a municipal official has called us and asked us a question as simple as, am I following open meeting law? To as complex as, uh, you know, the deepest, most strangest question you can imagine about municipal government. Uh, we do that free of charge to you and hopefully save you out of your legal bills here and there. So that instead of asking the community attorney, you're asking us. The second thing we do is we're writing now, and I'd encourage all of you, info at blct.org. Send an email anytime you want. We get back to you within 24 to 48 hours. A attorney will review it. Info at blct.org. We provide knowledge, training. So on the 28th of July, we have a uh, budgeting for select board members. If you are a new select board member, I highly recommend hopping on that webinar. It's uh, an all, a full morning. We have a government finance specialist we just hired about three months ago to talk about doing things differently. We've never had a full-time government finance specialist. You can now call us and talk to somebody in the trenches who has been a CFO for a town. She was in Milton, St. Albans, and Essex. Turns out city changes and mergers and independence makes employees very happy to move out of certain places. So we benefited from it. But that asset is for you too in building knowledge. We represent you in the state house. This is the biggest thing. I'm going to go through some victories we had this year and things I want you to know about in case you can benefit from them. We provide insurance. Uh, you know, in the 80s, the market hardened. Uh, municipalities could get uh, insurance or were paying triple, quadruple what they were the year before. So Bill and his friends <laughs> at the time uh, formed uh, an insurance pool, uh, a risk pool that you folks are now members of. And uh, all but four cities and towns of Vermont are members of our uh, risk pool. And I'll talk about some of the advantages of that in a second. And the fifth way we do that is by providing connection. Town fair. October 6th and 7th. I hope you'll all come. I hope you'll encourage the municipal, your municipal employees to come. This is where 500 of you come together and talk about common problems, common successes, to have a moment to connect with other leaders. So those are kind of the five key things we do. Give me the next slide. Don't worry. This, I wanted to highlight some of our successes this year. Uh, we answered 4,000 municipal inquiry service questions this year. Those are those info at the LCT things from your fellow select board members. Our insurance side, the middle and the top, we return $3.1 million in equity to our towns this year. What does that mean? It means we charged you X and we were able to return a percentage of that X because our uh, the risk pool is really healthy because so many people are members, they're managing risk really well, they were good investment returns. The private sector doesn't do that. This is double what we've ever returned to our members before. So that is a big deal in our books. That's, that's winning <laughs> for you, not for us, for you. Uh, talked about the State House. We've had 350,000 web sessions on our web page this year. You know, a lot of that was in ARPA, uh, which I know the different and some select board members have been talking to us about the American Rescue Plan. That's the next number, 2,000. This last year, we responded to 2,000 inquiries about ARPA, including about a half dozen from the folks. And the last thing I want to mention about successes is, uh, you know, the federal government tried to give this ARPA money that you're spending 
uh, to the counties. And they actually decided that Vermont had county government. Uh, it's very strange. It took us about three months to successfully advocate with the governor and the congressional delegation to get that money to come directly to you instead of going to your county government where inevitably they would have likely found a way to spend a little of that money before coming to you. So I call that a big victory. Going forward, we have a strategic plan. It's on our website. I'm not going to spend much time here, but I just want to point out the, on the left, these four pillars of our plan. One, we're trying to grow a sustainable and relevant member focused organization. That's what makes us unique. You own us. Two, we're trying to strengthen your capacity. You know Vermont's a Dillon's rule state, which means you have no authority except that by which the government, the state house gives you. We're trying to make a case that you deserve more authority because you're being asked to do more and more. You're being asked to solve climate change at the local level. You can't do that unless the state house gives you some authority. We're trying to help you develop and attract outstanding talent. As we're helping you with the recruitment for Bill's replacement, we know firsthand it's hard to find people like Bill. You know, it's hard to find the next generation of municipal leaders. It's hard to find the next generation of you, select board members. This is part of what we're really spending a lot of time on. Today. And finally, we're trying to help you champion inclusive and resilient communities, whether it be to adapt to climate change, to build housing, to, you know, housing for all, and uh, dealing with equity issues. Next slide. I'm going quickly because I just I want to get to questions. I wanted to highlight three things we're doing. I already talked about ARPA. We fought for, so this is one of the three things I wanted to highlight for you that we're doing right now. Um, we hired, hired a former municipal manager, the former Department of Housing and Community Economic Development Director Katie Buckley to manage an ARPA program for you. So you could ask somebody questions so that you could get interpreted, the federal guidance interpreted by an expert. She's been there. She also advocated for your money to be more flexible. If you remember, there were those four categories or five categories that you can spend the money in. You know, Katie and the league went and worked with the National League of Cities to make sure that that money was more flexible. So you get that exemption up to $10 million. So you could use that money in a more flexible way. Just because we've done that doesn't mean we think you should spend it on anything. We still go through this graphic on the left, the Venn diagram. Prioritize good governance, leverage your ARPA aid, and invest in best long-term recovery projects. We still hope you'll hit that target. And Katie's still available to help you if you have any questions. Next one. <laughs> She's reading my mind. We have spent a lot of time this last year, these last two years, right before I got there, trying to give you resources to deal with justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the world. We know this. That, that you know, rooms like this one are filled with people showing up and saying, what are you doing to make sure that our town is welcoming? What are you doing to make sure our town uh, isn't discriminating? What are you doing to stop our town from making mistakes in policing, right? To prevent our town, I shouldn't say stop, prevent our town from making mistakes in policing. So we formed an equity committee. One of your own is a I didn't regular updates. Uh, <laughs> we have 15 municipalities represented on the equity committee. And we're not trying to tell you what to do. We're trying to build resources in case the town wants to do something. And it's asking, like they always do 4,000 times a year, how do we do this? <laughs> uh, how do you deal with equity? And so this equity committee has built a plan, uh, which you can check out on our website if you're interested, what we're going to do to help you. But most importantly, we've started two or three things right now. On Thursday, we will be announcing a welcoming and engaging communities cohort, which invites the select board members and managers to join other communities, up to 15 communities, and going through a six month process where they'll learn about equity issues, they'll practice some equity issues, they'll talk about cultural transformation of organizations, and we'll do a survey of all of your municipal staff and employees. Uh, the belonging and inclusion survey that the state of Vermont actually uses. So this very interesting thing, applications will open on Thursday, applications are due. So I told you there were, there were things I'm asking of you. Consider applying for this program if you're interested. Um, applications will be due at the end of August. We're also launching on Thursday an equity toolkit. It's a 10 part toolkit that Alyssa and the equity committee have helped us build that shows best practices. What are other communities doing? What, you know, have they adopted the Declaration of Inclusion? Are there other things besides the Declaration of Inclusion they should consider? How have they formed equity committees? What do their equity committees look like? What's something I should read about this that relates to municipal government? What training should I offer my staff? Go down the long list. And we're partnering with people 
like the Office of Racial Equity and DCF to provide grant resources. So right now, uh, the Vermont Community Foundation has grants of up to ten thousand dollars to help towns do equity programs. So if you're interested, there's something. That's the second thing I wanted to talk about today. The third is IT, IT, IT. Next slide. Information technology. We did a member survey last fall, last summer. The number one thing people asked for was help with cybersecurity and IT. And so we went out with Champlain College and built an IT options catalog, which can help you understand what things you should be thinking about. You should check it out. We built an RFQ template. So if you wanted to go out and uh, hire either managed IT services or cyber services, you could cybersecurity services, you can steal it from the template. Uh, and uh, services sample RFQ. Uh, so uh, not just the template, but actually it, it goes through what one would look like. So we can expect to do more of this IT work in the future. And you'll see, I'll come back to that at the end. Oh, you're good. You're right here. I like how you're keeping me moving. <laughs> so just uh, only three more slides. I wanted to highlight a couple of successes in the state house this year because it will apply to you. And it probably will apply after Bill leaves because if Bill was here, I know he'd bring this to you and make sure you've got the money from the state. There was the, the biggest opportunity is this thing called the Municipal Energy Resilience Grant Program. It's almost $50 million uh, in resources, uh, $36 million in grants to towns, up to a half million dollars to do energy uh, work in buildings, municipal buildings. You can do assessments. Of five million dollars for assessments, and then fifth five hundred thousand dollars in actual grants to do work. So keep an eye on that one if you have a energy hub. This building obviously not going to be there. I saw the heating system with Bill a couple of months back. The second one is this forty million dollar community recovery and re revitalization grant program. Uh, we fought to get municipalities included in this grant program. They weren't last year, so now municipalities can apply for up to a million dollars. Um, to support uh, recovery and revitalization in their you know, business community, in their community. The third one I wanted to highlight was we talked about the I talk. We haven't talked at all, I apologize. About uh, Dylan's law, well, Dylan's rule, we successfully got a municipal authority bill passed this year, which devolves a little more power to you via ordinance. Uh, one being allowing non-resident officers to serve at your, you know, bless you. <laughs> If you decide to do so, you can now do so without going to the state house to allow for non-resident officers to serve on your planning commission, things like that. If you decide to eliminate something with the town constable, you don't need to go back for a charter change. You can actually do that by ordinance. If you want to go without changing the size of municipal panels, it also permanently enshrines some emergency authorities. So if we ever have another pandemic, uh, we won't need to wait for the state house to. Uh, uh, preserving qualified immunity for law enforcement officers. We had a victory there this year. Who knows if we'll have another one next year. We're ex we expanded the Think Vermont Relocation Initiative, the issue to uh, allow to, to pay people to move here. We successfully expanded that to municipal employees. And we created the uh, VLCT Federal Assistance Program. The legislature funded a position at VLCT to help you chase down federal grants. And then finally, some big victories in housing investments that we and many others uh, championed. So there's more money coming to housing. A lot more in the legislative report. I have a call to action before I finish. Next slide, four of them. Uh, Waterbury, as a member of Passive, our risk pool is eligible for up to $10,000 through a Passive loss control grant. I know Bill would apply for one of these before he left, if he had time. But somebody should be tracking this because there's no match. There's usually a match required for these. These loss control grants are things like anything that you can really tie to reducing the likelihood of a, a claim coming against you. Uh, think backup cameras for fire trucks and for public works vehicles. Think cameras to prevent uh, theft. There's a long list of things. I hope you will apply for one because there is no cap this year. No, uh, not there is a cap. There is no match required. Second thing, you folks haven't applied for cybersecurity training through Know Before. We have a full reimbursement program this year uh, where we'll reimburse you for the entire cost of the Know Before training. This would send, this would enable all of your municipal employees, appointees, 
and elected officials to get training on uh, know before on cyber threats. You know, they'd send you the emails to test. They can even do penetration testing of your staff to say, we're going to send an email and see if you respond to it and let us <laughs> into your system and then correct that problem. Uh, the third bullet, call to action. We have a very robust ancillary benefit program. By that, I mean your dental insurance and vision insurance. Waterbury participates in our disability and long-term care, I believe, right, Bill? Life, disability, Life. long-term care. Life, disability, long-term care. You do not participate in dental and vision. I uh, encourage you to think about us. And also, this year, a new one is pet insurance. So uh, sounds silly, but it's more and more uh, in demand by those young millennials. And then finally, we stopped. We're not communicating with you in print much. We're doing everything online. So follow us. Uh, subscribe to mailings at dlct.org to get our bi-weekly news emails, to get our journal. Uh, and we're communicating via Facebook. That's the only social media platform we use. So follow us on Facebook to get updates. My last thing, a couple of upcoming opportunities for you to participate. One, Town Fair, October 6th and 7th. Be there, be square. Two, I mentioned the government finance overview for select boards. The 28th, be a webinar all morning, but it's well worth it. I, I apologize for those last two bullets under there. That's obviously a typo. <laughs> and then three, on August 11th, join us in uh, my downtown Montpelier with Senator Leahy to celebrate uh, his accomplishments to help our downtowns like Waterbury recover after things like Irene. And, it's free and open to the public. There's food available for purchase, but uh, I hope you'll come and join us. Uh, so that's all I had. Are there? I'm sorry to rattle off at you, but I really appreciate it. I hope I stayed under 10 minutes. I don't think I did. <laughs> Any questions for me? Um, you've uh, had some trainings available, but uh, they happen to be uh, during the daytime. And I'm wondering if there's any possibility of doing it in the evening for those of us that work and can't get the time off. Absolutely. Uh, a couple options. One, I, I'd love the feedback as to what types of trains you want us to offer in the evening hours. We're trying to do more on demand stuff where it's recorded, mm -hmm. but we know people want real time training. So, one, tell me what you want, and we will try to make that available in the evenings <laughs> instead of during the day. Uh, two, um, we can do custom trainings. And it's not very expensive. So we can come here, and if you all want a certain type of training, we can provide that training to you and bring in bring one of our attorneys in to, to do that. We have a bunch of stock ones, but also if you have something in particular, we can come here at, at evening anytime and, and do that training. So uh, yes. Are the are the are they recorded during the day so that if we signed up and couldn't attend, we can rewatch it later? I think they are. Okay. So we do on demand training. So if you register and can't make it. Uh, you'll get a copy of the recording and access to the recording. But I know it's not the same. Not the same as a lot. Yeah. Ask the question. Sure. Thanks for that feedback, though. I need to hear more of it. As a new executive director, I need to know what we're doing wrong. And I think I've gotten that feedback a couple of times. We need more night and yeah. weekend training. Yeah, we like to, you know, work on, uh, you know, creating that next generation of, of leaders, but and also <laughs> most of us have to work during the day. Um, and so the particular, like the loss control, we can find all that information on the website for applications, deadlines, et cetera. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. There are no deadlines on the loss control grants. Okay. The only deadline is next year, we might not be able to offer them with no match. Mm -hmm. And you're eligible to receive them every year. So if you're, if you're good, you can almost pay for your insurance or a quarter portion of your insurance every year through the loss control grants. And you've gotten them before, right? Yeah, we've yeah. gotten you have another question? Yeah, um, I was at the, uh, the Lifestyle and Housing uh, Policy Committee. Uh, and, oh, the Quality of Life. Committee. Quality, yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, Karen Horn mentioned that uh, she was looking for grant writers um, because there's a lot of money, as you just uh, pointed out, but uh, finding people to, that have the time uh, and inclination to write grants uh, is uh, at a premium. And uh, so I was wondering if you had any suggestions about that uh, for towns like ours. Yeah, so one grant, what's your population? 5,000. 5,000. So right now, Waterbury is eligible for the READY program. Have you taken advantage of the READY program? Not sure. 
It's under five or under seventy five hundred. They got me. Sorry. All right. So there was there is a program at DHCB that helps towns uh, and, and will actually pay for a grant later. We at DLCT through the special assistance program intend to build a stable of grant writers that you can contact us and get a preset this discounted rate of grant writers. That's one thing we're working on for you because we see the need as well. We also need to train some grant writers. I can't tell you how many select boards I visit where the select board members are the ones writing the grants and they, yeah, they never had training. They just do it because that's what they're going to do. So uh, we're talking about doing some select board trainings for how to write a good grant application, things like that. But there aren't enough people to write grants for the $3 trillion that's out okay. there. But we're going to try. We're trying to build the resource for you. Thanks. One thing while Ted is here, we talked about the uh, $3 million that was returned to a lot of municipalities from the various insurance trusts. And as Ted said, it was in the late 70s, I think, when the unemployment trust first was created. And then uh, the health trust was created in 1982. Health trust isn't necessary anymore. Uh, I was not part of creating the health trust, but was one of the first uh, you know, people that was able to buy it for in this pattern that I worked for. And then Passive was formed in 1986 uh, when that hard market that Ted was talking about came in. Uh, the thing that the other really important thing that you should know about the insurance trusts, especially Passive, um, is that not only do they return uh, premiums when the balance sheet says that they can, and they have to live by all the same rules that uh, the Department of Financial Regulation or whatever banking insurance is what I still know it as. Uh, they, they have to live by all the rules that uh, financial regulation applies to insurance companies in terms of reserves and risk and um, uh, secondary insurance and things like that. Uh, but the, the main benefit that I find, and I'm telling you this now because I won't be here after December, and every once in a while, um, somebody knocks on my door or calls me or sends me an email and says, oh, we want to bid on your insurance. In fact, we don't want to bid on your insurance. We just want you to put your property down for insurance with us. And we can get you a better price. And uh, a couple of years ago, I actually answered an email uh, or emailed the guy who had come into Stowe and, and said, these are all the reasons why we belong to the league and why we're with the passive program. And if you're going to come in and you want to sell us something for two or $3,000 less than we can buy it from, even if it was $10,000 less, I would recommend to my board that we stay with the league because they understand sovereign immunity, which most uh, other insurance companies don't have a clue what that's about. The legislature, um, you know, uh, there's laws in place that, that uh, set the bar pretty high for when people want to sue the municipality for things that are kind of everyday occurrences. So potholes, highways, sewer backups, and the like. Those are all governmental functions, governmental activities. And unless you can prove gross negligence, those things are fairly typically not covered. And it's not because we don't want to pay a, a claim to an individual, but we don't want to be open to these frivolous lawsuits that go on and on and end up you know, having um, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars of, of claims. So the, the, what I'd just like you to remember is that there are times when the market can beat passive price. Not very often. Uh, if we had a little bit better claims uh, history in, you know, some of our areas, workers comp, we haven't been great in that for a few years. Um, if we had better claims and they help us with with that and talked about risk, um, managing risk and, and uh, being careful about how we operate. Um, 
but in the in the when we have a bad year, we might be susceptible to a lower price. But even if they can beat them on price, they can't beat them on service from my perspective. And uh, there's people like me from other cities and towns who are on the board that work with Ted and Joe Damiato who runs these programs. And it's really, I think, the most valuable thing the league does for us. And every once in a while, and I would imagine when a new manager comes in, especially if the new manager isn't from Vermont, and some new managers are going to say, gee, I can save the town $10,000, and that's going to be, you know, a big feather in my cap right off the bat. Resist the temptation to do that, because in the long run, you're going to be way better off with the municipal pool. Uh, we're in it together with our uh, colleagues across the state, and we pretty much understand. When Irene happened, you know, we had we had flood insurance. We had flood insurance. The village got uh, you know three hundred fifty thousand dollars for the municipal building that got flooded out. And if we were a commercial insurance company, um, probably wouldn't have flood insurance at all. We have pump stations that were covered. We had uh, we didn't have a lot of damage to our roads or or structures, but towns that had bridges that were flooded, uh, they they got help when if you know FEMA didn't in times that FEMA didn't step in. So uh, just don't don't fall to that temptation because it's a place where people try to pick us off one at a time. Thanks for that, Wallace. Can I say that a little better? Any other questions for Ted? Thanks for coming. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Thanks for what you do. Appreciate it. Yeah. I'll put in one last point before we go. <laughs> in terms of your, your message about um, you know trying to recruit officials and select board members and things like that, try to remember too that we need employees. And if you can work with places like BTC, you know it's harder and harder to find people that want to operate a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, you know, water plants. Uh, these are things everybody takes for granted that they're going to turn the water on and it's going to come out of the tap clean and safe. Um, we still need people to do those things. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but that's just another thing that we need to lead to help uh, with, uh, with getting those kind of people trained and getting the word out that being a municipal employee isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's an actual easy plan. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, man. Uh, next up, we have Vermont Antique and Classic Colors, August 12 to 14. Yeah, so uh, nobody's here from the Antique, uh, Vermont Antique World Automobile Society. Uh, I think this is the fifth year that they will be having the uh, car show down at Fires Field. They have a very detailed application here, um, Friday, August 12th to Sunday, August 14th. Um, these folks are good at what they do and they've been very conscientious um, and they've contacted uh, Bill Woodruff. Um, they've had contact with Nick uh, last year and in the past. Um, they're going to do what they have typically done. They have a, a, a what is it, a public, what's the term that they get from the state? That's what the public gathering program, I can't program. remember what it's called, but they're expecting uh, 20, up to 20, let's say 20 plants. That's going to be fun. <laughs> Anyway, um, they're asking for, yeah, expected guests, 20 to 25,000 over the three-day event, 500 vehicles, uh, 
25 water matches of temperate campers throughout the three day program. So they're mainly going to be at Fires Field uh, for all of their uh, showing and their judging and their car corral. If anybody's interested in buying an antique car, you can go down to their car corral and, and see what people have for sale. Um, on Saturday at 3 30, they plan a parade from Fires Field up Route 2 through the roundabout down Main Street uh, to the to the train station and then back. Uh, they will provide the um, the uh, sheriffs that they need to control the intersections. They've, they've been meeting with the state police. The state police understands what uh, they're going to be doing. They expect about 800 vehicles. Uh, as I said, the parade from 3.30, it runs for an hour or so. And then there's uh, they're asking for a street dance, which would require you to agree to close Snow Street from Main Street to Main Street, starting at 3.30 in the afternoon. Uh, they've done this, uh, as I said, I think this is the fifth year. There was one year that they couldn't do it because of COVID. And so I don't know if it's actually fourth event in five years or fifth event in six years, it doesn't really matter. So um, our recommendation as a staff is to go ahead and approve what they've asked for. Uh, they have um, Casella in place to deal with the uh, trash and recycling. They've got the uh, uh, company will be providing the uh, portalettes that they need, not only providing them, but maintaining them throughout the weekend. Um, so, uh, they're, they're very organized, and uh, I think that they will be good to go. So for the parade, they're asking North and South Main Streets from Winooski Street to Park Street to be closed. What they'll do is they'll be coming from Paris Field through the roundabout. Traffic will come through the roundabout as well, but regular traffic when they get to Winooski Street will be detoured down Winooski Street to go across the back side of the river. So the antique cars will continue down to the train station. All of the vehicles during the parade will be asked to go around through the back side of the river in Duxbury. Park Street, Rotarian Place, and Park Row are what they're asking to be closed from 3.30 to 5.30. It probably will be the better part of an hour or so that the parade's actually going on, but they've got a have the logistics on each end. And then the Stowe Street from Main Street to Union Street closed. The request is from uh, the dance will be from 6 to 10, but they'll be closing the Stowe Street at around 3.30 in order to set up. And we'll be having a DJ from WDEV. Uh, and the DJ, of course, will be playing music, uh, they have indicated the, the volume of the, of the music will be manageable and within reason, and we've never had a problem with that in the past. So this will be on that again, though. August 12th, which is a Friday through August 14th, which is a Sunday. So uh, they'll be going into the fire field at around seven o'clock on Friday morning, and uh, the last folks will be pulling out except for the you know, tearing down, but four o'clock the show will end. Any other questions, comments? Have they given any indication to you as to how having here in Farseal compares to through the years they've had it themselves? Um, well, I talked to uh, uh, Ted, who was the uh, long time Chase Vermont uh, Chamber of Commerce guy. Man, this guy, Chris Burgess. Oh, Chris Barbieri. Barbieri. Mm -hmm. So, Chris Barbieri drove me through Waterbury. At the head of the map, according to the Penn State Parade in the 1967 Barracuda. And we talked about the car show. They, they love it here in, in Waterbury. Uh, the field is 
they feel much more uh, accommodated at Fires Field. Uh, it's level, it drains well. Well, no. Um, uh, there's enough room to have everybody and vendors and everything there. Um, it's a little bit challenging uh, when people are, go to the show and leave because they're right on the two and sometimes a little backed up. There's no, in Stowe, there's several side roads they can get off pretty quickly, or from Fires Field, you would better go all the way to Bolton pretty much, or all the way to the village before you can uh, get off the road. Um, you know, clearly we don't have the number of hotel rooms in Waterbury for a lot of people to stay here. So the Best Western and the Fairfield Inn get business, but a lot of folks who come, you know, there's there's 800 cars and uh, there's not 800 hotel rooms in Waterbury. So a lot of them still go up to Stowe. Um, the parade has been well received here, uh, so I, I think they they like it, and uh, they've got a contract here that you know, they're, they're planning to be here well into the future. I think. Yeah, I didn't know from a functionality standpoint if it was uh, as good or better, or not quite as good. Or yeah, they they, they, like they they're making it more. They seem happy. Uh, it, it's different. The parade route in Stowe, of course, is a little bit different than. Here, you know, they used the mountain road and they came right. You know, we have we have our kind of restaurant scene, which is a block and a half long in Waterbury, and they're good restaurants. And people should go. Not quite the same as Stowe, where they've got commercial from you know way up uh, all down the all the whole mountain road and then all the way to the village. But they're they're. they're good. So we'd recommend the motion to move um, that we accept the uh, application for the Vermont Antique and Classic Car Association. Okay. Yes, second. Yeah. <laughs> so moved and seconded. Further comments? Who's a question? Nice. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. Thank you so much. All right, we have an update, Hope Davy and Ice Center study. That was then. Um, on the partial tour, I assume they are letting the folks instance in great snow, but when we did our test there, they always appreciated a heads up ahead of the uh, loud music outside. Um, Okay, so in the interest of public transparency, um, you all appointed me to be the select board representative on the Parks Planning Study Task Force um, Steering Committee, excuse me. And again, just to review, um, this is the work that we are all approved to be done um, by SE Group using the funding that was voted on at town meeting before I was on the board. Um, so we had our first meeting last Wednesday um, with that steering committee. Um, the first update would be all of the steering committee information is being put as a planning study on the planning commission um, page of the town website. So both the agenda for that meeting and at this point the minutes are already up as well um, will be there for future things. Um, for today, I just want to give a general outline of the work we're doing. We don't have dates or anything finalized, but just so that the select board is aware of what future involvement will look like. Um, so SE Group kind of outlined four broad areas um, or four stages, I should say, for the study. So we're kind of in the first stage now, which is a lot of background and information gathering. Some of that they're doing with consultants. They're working with someone doing wetland delineation. They're getting working with um, Steve, I should say, our planning director, who is the chair of the steering committee, and obviously providing the staff support around getting them information on the studies that have been done and the like. Um, the three big pieces to flag for us are then kind of the next stages of public engagement. So once SE Group, again, kind of has a baseline understanding of what's going on, um, the big input stage is going to be a community visioning workshop. So this will be an opportunity for members of the public to comment in person throughout the evening, um, as well as through online surveys and other means. 
Um, we don't have a date finalized for that, but certainly I will report back to you all and be annoying on front porch forum and we'll put up flyers. The goal is really to get um, as much public input about the two sites as possible to determine next steps. So, no, about which month you're thinking? I think we're aiming for September at this point. Um, the timeline obviously wanted to complete within this calendar slash just for year for us. Sure. Um, and the goal was also that that would probably be more effective than August just because of school timing and the like. Um, so aiming for September, but nothing finalized. They were going to revise based on input. Um, the last two for us to say is after that workshop, the consultants are going to work on kind of a general concept. So like I'm a planning enthusiast, not a planner by training, but kind of what goes where and what are specific layouts um, for folks to weigh. They will present those concepts at a select board meeting. So that's the first to flag for us. I think we can choose, maybe it's just at a general Monday meeting, maybe we started early, maybe we do a different night if we think that would solicit more input, but they do intend to have that public concept presentation at a select board meeting. Um, and again, another opportunity for the public to provide input, um, again, kind of putting pieces together after the visioning input. Um, and then the final um, plan revisions based on those concepts and input um, would also be something they would present at one of our meetings, but probably with less um, intentional time for public input for that latter meeting. So again, that's kind of the big six month plan looking forward to the rest of the year. So I just want to um, to share that with everyone so that folks are aware um, and just flag those couple of particular pieces um, for us, which will be that visioning workshop. So both other select board members want to attend and also helping to spread the word. And then that we will have that concept presentation meeting and um, final plan, I guess, towards Bill's point earlier of getting the plan done <laughs> as soon as possible by December. So um, that's all I had. Again, Steve is really the staff week, but I just said, seems worthwhile to have on the agenda just as an update for everyone. Thank you. And happy to answer any questions or if things have particular input to um, doesn't have to be now, it can be after the meeting too, but on um, specific things we're looking to as the select boards see reflected in these final plans. Um, you know, again, happy to go into more details about their scope, obviously based on what we would like Question? Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you. Yeah, that's really helpful. And fantastic. Moving on to Waterbury Area Housing Task Force updates. Um, do you want to take a lead on that one? Or well, no? You can if you want. No, it's like, I mean, you can I would say, say, I think it's me again. And yeah. I was going to tell Ted, who I sometimes work with, that it's not always the Alyssa show. So I didn't accept it. But here we are. My, we select, board, my select board updates. Um, so we all made a motion at our June 20th meeting to work on creating a Waterbury Area Task Force and said we would work out the details on the structure and formation of the future. Um, uh, so before we get into that, I do have two clarifications. Um, I attended the last planning commission meeting and it was brought to my attention to emphasize that there had been a previous housing task force. So certainly I did some looking into since 2017 when I've been here, but in 2013, there was a housing task force group and it just wanted to be emphasized and acknowledged that folks have been involved in this work for many years and we're just trying to bring it back to the surface for right now. Um, and the other big point from the planning commission and also being a planning enthusiast um, is that this is all reflected on our municipal plan. And so um, this came after a conversation with an RW housing study, um, but really just reflecting that it's also priorities that have been in our municipal plan again since 2013, since we re-approved it in 2018 and since. Um, so in terms of next steps on formation of committee, I would say like personally, I'm not necessarily proposing that we take an action tonight. I guess we could just review the folks we had set for the committee. Um, and then if people have any input to share, we could vote on a structure at a future meeting. And I'm happy to take input. I haven't had a chance to meet with Bill or Steve right. kind of about their input. Um, the folks we had said initially were select board representation, planning commission, EFUD, public, um, and then I also had like downstreet or affordable housing provider. Um, but if there's other ideas folks have um, or other input, I'm going to try and circulate something before the next meeting to review it. Okay. And for your calendars and for your information, I think I told the board uh, at the last meeting that uh, 
I met with Downstreet with uh, Steve Watts' speech. Uh, we, we met with Downstreet in Ever North uh, a couple of weeks ago at the Stanley Wallace and Hall site. Uh, they are very interested in that site. Um, unfortunately, um, securing that site requires a little bit of a laborious process through the legislation. And uh, the, the state was willing to uh, give that site to the town back in 2013 after Tropical Storm Irene for us to build a municipal building there. Uh, we actually took the process through a fine vote, which failed, and ultimately we ended up building here. Um, I asked them to dust off that RFP and um, turn over the property to the town so we could work with the North and Down Street to get something going. And they said, well, that was um, quite specific for the municipal building and for the So we have to go through this process. Uh, the legislature ultimately has to pass a bill to, to sell the property. Um, I've written a letter to Alice Evans, uh, who's the uh, House, the chairperson of the uh, House Institutions Committee. I sent the same letter to Senator Joe Benning, who's currently in the same position in the Senate, except he's running for lieutenant governor, so he's not going to be there. Uh, Senator Benning did respond to me and said, this sounds pretty good. What I asked them to do was to, instead of waiting for the capital bill at the end of the session to try to move this property to get something done, that maybe they could take it up in the uh, uh, Budget Reconciliation Act, which happens earlier in the year, still going through the two institution committees, hoping to get some movement quicker because None of these organizations, Downstreet, Ever North, other uh, folks who do the same kind of work, they typically need um, site control before they can start fundraising, and it's difficult. Uh, so the best that they were hoping was that maybe there'd be an option from BGS Buildings and General Services, which controls the property for the state. Um, to have an option that basically said, we're going to give Waterbury an option for this parcel uh, subject to uh, legislative action. But even that is um, not necessarily quick enough. So those two organizations are very interested in the Stanley Watson site, but they are also interested in 51 South Main Street. And they attended the EFUD meeting last week and uh, folks were here from Down Street, not in the North. Uh, and I talked about uh, whether or not 51 South Main Street could be used for this and explained that there are grant and funding options available to them that they need to have uh, site control by November for which to meet these deadlines. So on uh, the 10th of August, I believe it is, um, folks from Downstreet are gonna come here. The EFUD commissioners are gonna hold their regular meeting uh, in the afternoon, late afternoon of the 10th. And then right after that regular meeting closes, there'll be a public information meeting to talk to the public about the prospect of EFUD uh, divesting itself of this property, whether it's through sale or donation, that that's all subject to um, lots of uh, issues. And just so you understand the process, a municipality on the vote of its legislative body can vote to sell or donate the property. However, if the legislative body does it, uh, we're in Vermont and we like people and we like democracy. So there's an option or the ability for people to submit and circulate a petition to hold a special district meeting or town meeting to overturn the action of the, of the legislative body. So in the past, uh, the EFUD commissioners and the village trustees who came before them 
had always indicated that they would go directly to a town meeting vote as opposed to do it on their own motion. So anyway, that's a, an update as to where we are. Uh, Downstreet is very interested. They defund commissioners asked Downstreet that if they were able to acquire the uh, 51 South Main Street property and develop it for housing, would they no longer have interest in the Stanley Watson site? They said, no, we would love to do two projects. There's a need for workforce housing. And we think Waterbury is a, a place that uh, it, it can work. We've got several examples of working with those uh, entities here in town. And, um, you know, Lad Hall, the most recent one. And from my perspective, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful project. Um, I've been in the building recently uh, because I was called there to do a rental housing inspection by somebody who's concerned about the circulation and the airflow in their building and that they didn't have screens. That's been rectified now, but I was in the building. It's well maintained. Uh, and the people that live there seem to to enjoy it and make the best of it. So anyway, that's that's where we are. So if you're around, I know a couple of you are district residents and you're certainly welcome to come to that. Uh, well, three of you are. So um, if you're interested on the 10th, there'll be a public information meeting. Dana had his hand up for a while um, on Zoom. <laughs> You're gonna figure it out. <laughs> Dana, we can't hear you. You're muted. It's your hand. He's not. It's just his uh, audio. No. Is it no, it's his audio. He's off mute. It's just his audio isn't working. Okay. I can tell. Um, in the meantime, I'll give you a minute, Dana, and then speak up if you are able to connect it. Um, I think we can chat about the composition or the structure of the committee. Um, and then something that I want to keep in mind, too, is that um, we've talked at, at length about committees that it doesn't have to be um you know i think How about so, now uh, one second dana sorry thanks um, yeah yeah my fault met with uh last week i met with someone from um from the county uh we had gotten some emails with concerned about unhoused folks in the park and about town so i haven't had time to type up these notes just yet but i will distribute them um and he talked about our housing task force and um some best practices are then having a homelessness task force as well within that you know calling it what we may but um so that we can then include people who have more expertise in the subject that might meet separately, or if we don't think there's capacity for that, inviting those folks in to talk to the um, you know, committee at large, but um, just keeping that in mind. So, um, but we can come back to that. Dana, go ahead, thank you. Sorry, adventures in Bluetooth headsets, my apologies. Um, I just wanted to jump in and say um, thanks to Alyssa for noting uh, that she attended the Planning Commission meeting. We appreciate that. Um, she stayed for the whole thing, which is above and beyond. So thank you, Alyssa. Um, and also a uh, great job in summarizing, I think what the planning commission was discussing following that meeting. Um, so just noting that, you know, the 2018 town plan does have a lot of information on housing. And so I think that that would be good going forward to reference. I know we're early days on this task force, um, but that is a great document and it has a lot of concrete suggestions, um, not only for policy, but also potential uh, financing um, for some of these housing issues. So it's a great resource it, for anyone who's interested in, in reading more about that. Um, I think it starts on page 40 or so. 
Um, and then I think the other thing that I would like to note as far as the housing task force goes is that I think it's great that we're talking about involving downstreet um, and then potentially reaching out to specific private developers, housing developers within the area um, would be great. I know that Jason Wolf has been interested in this topic in the past. Um, I think there are some others. Um, and so I'm happy to sort of put out some feelers in the area, but I think it's important to have some of those folks involved in the conversation as well, because it's one thing to create suggestions and regulatory framework. Um, but when the rubber meets the road, we need to know what's going to work for, you know, private developers as well as the, you know, public developers like Downstreet or other individuals. So anyway, thank you for the work. Sorry for the technological delay. Really embarrassing. Um, and that's all I had to say. So thank you. Thanks, Anna. Um, to create the task force structure, is that something that we need to vote on to create or just agree on as a consensus? How does that work though? It's, it's a task force that the select board is going to uh, create. Yeah. And so you're you're the creators. You can do whatever you want with it as far as structuring how you want to. Uh, you've already advertised a little bit, I think, uh, seeking people or at least just verbally, yeah, yeah not putting out. Right. But yeah, it's really up to the select board. You, there's there's no prescribed uh, structure or number of people or sure two. i meant specifically do we need to like have a vote on record for the creation of the structure or we can just decide as a consensus and then go forward with appetite or soliciting yeah i don't think it really matters obviously okay. you know consensus or a vote mm -hmm. it, you're going to come to an agreement mm -hmm. so okay just trying to follow the rules yeah <laughs> um any input as to that structure as to reiterate, as Alyssa had noted from last meeting, we had a select board member, planning commission, EFUD, a public member or two, and then either somebody from Downstreet or um, affordable housing provider. And then Danny upgraded and then got some funding to provide a license moderator. Oh, RW, thank you so much. It was, yeah. Awesome. And I would just offer my personal comment that I really agree and echo your comment around potentially like a larger committee. I think it's a question of balancing get unwieldy at the 12 to 15 mm -hmm. size, but also if it's a question of task force is or smaller subgroups. And I guess um, in terms of next steps, I did just want to like Steve said, he was potentially willing to provide staff support and that's not a conversation I had with him. Mm -hmm. So that's, I never want anyone slowing down and I think maybe we could advertise anyway, but I just do want to acknowledge that he yeah, kind of offered some support mm -hmm. on the municipal side and I kind of closed that group. So um, that's my only hesitation in terms of um, or thinking around that stuff. So we could leave this meeting with a potential structure and then follow up with Steve before going forward with solicitation and um, first meeting. Right. Yeah, or uh, perhaps uh, Alyssa could meet with Steve and come up with a proposed structure mm -hmm. that circulate uh, for the next meeting. Thank you. Anything else on that topic? All right, that concludes the select board items. Moving on to managers' items. First is review naming private road, Honeysuckle Hill Road off of Sweet Road. Okay, I think you have information on that from Steve, probably. Mm -hmm. um, next step, yeah, um, so I mean, any road that has three or more houses on it needs to be named for the A911 purposes. So this is off Sweet Road. You have more information than I do because oh, sure. I, <laughs> I didn't get the email. So um, was everyone able to read? Would it be helpful if I read the email? Or has, has everyone reviewed it? Did you get it? Yeah, I'm working yeah. on the project. So oh, <laughs> so you know very well. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. I wrote to Steve and asked if you know if there's any issues that seem straightforward. Um, and if there was any other considerations, and um, you know, he said he his advice was to move forward and uh, everything seemed in order. So 
take a motion. I'll move to accept the name of Honeysuckle Hill Road, uh, this new development off of Sweet Road. Second. Moved and seconded. Further conversation? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. Passes. Moving forward, discussing WASI and new facility. Okay, I think all of you are very aware of the fact that WASI has been looking for new digs for uh, quite some time now. The, um, the town of Waterbury donated space uh, and, and built a building up behind our highway garage before I arrived here in 1988. I'm not sure exactly when the building was built. Uh, we have uh, a lease with with WASI um, and the facility is um, small and uh, not state of the art and especially during COVID and uh, PCR testing and all of the other stuff that they've been doing to deal with COVID, it's cramped quarters. Uh, Mark Podgeweight is here. Uh, and um, a couple of weeks ago, he talked to me, uh, asked me to come up, and I met uh, with Mark and others there about where they were in the process. Um, ARPA money is available. I'm not suggesting that we give it to them, but the part of the conversation that, that uh, Mark and I had was about that. So Mark, you're here, and I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. Right. Apologize. If you both want to come up to the table, um, I did ask Mark to remind me um, what the contributions are that that we make as a municipality for the operation of Wasi. I think all of you understand that Wasi is. Wadley Ambulance Service Incorporated. It's a private, not for profit organization that provides ambulance service to Wadley, uh, Duxbury, parts of Duxbury, and is it all of Duxbury and parts of Moore. Parts of yep. Moore. Okay. Sorry about that. That's right. And um, so uh, up until a few years ago, there was no request for uh, a public. Uh, appropriation for WASI to, to any town. Uh, Waterbury had, as I said, uh, donated the, the land and provided the building, um, and that was it. Um, a few years ago, they, they found it necessary to ask the communities that they served to uh, ante up some money um, all in, and we, we monetized the value of the uh, Lease and the and the building, and then there's a there's a a, a cash appropriation which is in the fifty thousand dollar range now. So water is all in uh, total to Wasi with the building and the appropriation is about one hundred eleven thousand dollars right now. Uh, Seventy six percent of the money that comes from municipalities comes from water. Duxbury pays about 20% of the total, 28,487.50. So say 28,500. And Moortown, which they just cover a sliver of, uh, $6,130 comes from Moortown, about 4%. The total municipal appropriation, including that uh, monetized lease, is. Uh, 145,620. So uh, we had a fairly sparse agenda tonight. I called Mark last week, asked him if he wanted to come in and talk to the board to give you an update as to where they are and what, if anything, that they're hoping to work out with, with Waterbury and what uh, can they go for. Okay. Okay. So where we are now, we finally have to. 4.5 years living for a location and after five or six different locations, five or six different designs. Finally, I found one over on the, the, the uh, water race road, right by where we're born, it's old fuel tanks are. So that's the, the, that's the location. Plans have been drawn up, design have been done, this preliminary design has been done. 
permit process began from the last week. Um, we, in anticipation, and this was before I got here six years ago, we're putting money away for this because we knew at some point in time this was going to happen. Pre hospital emergency medicine had changed. We've gone from an all volunteer state, which we had in the 70s when Watsi was, was founded, to slowly going to now we need to pay more people. We have more combination departments. There are only two departments in the entire state of Vermont right now that don't pay their folks something. We've had other things go on too, as far as pre-hospital emergency medicine goes back in back in the late 90s, EMT classes were pretty much 100 bucks. That's what they are. Now it's about $1,800 to get one person just put through the training, let alone the hours that they have to dedicate, the time they have to dedicate, the changes that keep occurring, we keep adding the protocols, we keep it, it, they do more things in the field. We're adding more things as a service and to the community, such as CPR training, soccer boot training. We have a car seat filling station that we do as well. So there's all kinds of extra added perks that go along with, with pre hospital emergency medicine. What we don't have are volunteers. We don't have time to volunteer. We have folks that, as we all know, dual incomes, part time jobs, the whole bit. People just don't have the time to commit like they used to. There needs to be some kind of some kind of cash incentive for them to, 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 to hang around. So we've gone to that more of a, of a combination department than we were 100% volunteer back in the day. So now we have two full time employees, and I did it myself, and we have eight per diem folks who work a variety of shifts. We're happy to report, though, since I got here six years ago, since Maggie got here two years ago, we've built a solid core team. Not that we didn't have a solid core team before, but we've expounded on that, that team. And we've gone from, from issues where we had holes and gaps in the schedule to now being 100% covered every day, 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. seven days a week, which is, which, which is a milestone. So a lot, a, lot of, a lot of, I don't say a lot, there are agencies in the Vermont EMS District 6 where we are located now that are having trouble putting their, their slots. So with that, though, comes other considerations that we didn't have to consider back then, such as room, training room, size, size of equipment. We have a new ambulance coming next May. It's eight inches too long to fit in the current bay. And it's not because we ordered an ambulance too big. It's how big they are. Um, there's sleeping quarters that we don't have. Yet we want to have people 24-7. We need to, because of the, of the, of the reduction in volunteer force that we have in the local area, we need to be able to branch out to other communities farther away. We need to be able to provide seating quarters for these folks, kitchen facilities, and so on. So, which the new design is all inclusive. Well, when we back and pop into the, into the financing and where we are now and where we're going, and yeah. an ambitious piece of this deal is when we open up the ground and we pop this. As Mark mentioned, you know, going into this project, we have $1.5 million available. That's from both savings and from COVID-19 response. So we got a call to set up some testing sites. Uh, we did so. We responded to do uh, at-home vaccinations, and that expanded into doing vaccinations, not only in Waterbury, but throughout the state. And when we're doing those vaccinations, we are being paid by the state, those testing and vaccination sites. Uh, to date, we've administered over 47,000 vaccinations and over 150,000 tests. So we're pretty grateful for the team that we've built to be able to do that. Um, in 2020, just want to highlight their ambulance service of the year. So that was kind of from the work, not just COVID, but from the quality of the team that we have, which we're really proud of. I think that our team is as diverse as Waterbury is. We've got young people, we have old people, we have, you know, um, People from all walks of life, which are grateful. Generally, it's one person who's paid on each volunteer, and there's two volunteers. So, as Mark was saying, volunteers are decreasing. We do still have people who are volunteering. Um, Mark just last year got a lifetime uh, in EMS award. So, the work that he's brought to Waterbury has been huge in building that reputation. So, like I said, $1.5 million available. Um, since we started fundraising in the spring um, and a little bit before that, we've raised $730,000. So, that's committed and or given. So there's some folks who say, I want to give a multi-year gift. So that leaves us so with 1.5, uh, yep. So we have 270,000 left to raise 
So those are some of that 750 is pledges, right? Exactly. The majority of it mm -hmm. is pledges, yeah. people that want to give over. And some of them are contingent on where the project is and where the project is going. So making sure that we obviously people don't want to make money until they know that we are going to do it. So um, we're feeling like Mark said, like we're on track. Um, but we still have $270,000 left to raise, which is quite a bit. And we do anticipate with that $2.5 million budget that we have right now, with the cost of materials, the supply chain issues, we do anticipate that goal going up um, in the future from that 2.5, just because of the, the way the world is right now. So while we're grateful for how far we've gone, we still have a long way to go and every little bit of support helps. And we've been blown away by the library community and the way folks have stepped up. And just to highlight, we are grassroots to the max. You know, we're, Mark and I are full time. We're there 48 hours a week at least. And then an ambulance call goes, and we run out of the office and hop on the ambulance and go run a call. So it's not like we have a fundraising team, a marketing team. Uh, you know. So we're definitely it's doing you. this. <laughs> it's us. And so we're definitely doing our best um, and trying really hard to get that messaging out and have those donor meetings and do everything that a fundraising campaign should professionally do. But we're stretched pretty thin between COVID response. We're still vaccinated. We have 90 vaccination clinics this week this month and plan to continue that into the fall. So 90? 90. This month? This month. <laughs> so it's a pretty good day. Yeah. Pretty day. <laughs> With no weekends. Yes. No, we don't, we're, <laughs> what? <laughs> so, you know, and it's been, and when we're really grateful for our crew, you know, it's not just we've got maybe 44 people who are on the ambulance. We've also expanded to have a team of 200 employees, whether it's UVM nursing students, EMTs from the surrounding area. Mark has a network from being in EMS for over 20 years of people that he's trained that have joined our team just to help with the vaccination and COVID response. And there's definitely a future for us in all sorts of the inter-facility transfers um, and other types of response that we can be doing, community paramedicine, and doing more on the front lines like Mark was saying, which we've done the training. So um, we're grateful for whatever support and we have been not only fundraising the client for the grant as well, which several have been successful. However, there are not a whole heck of a lot of grants for this particular type of project, unfortunately. Years ago, we had the assistant of firefighter grants, for example, which still is, exists today, but back when that grant first came out, facilities were part of that. Now they're no longer. Senator Sanders introduced a bill last March. I can't remember the name of top of my head, but we would include funding to, to support facilities, new facilities, reconstruction, et cetera. Unfortunately, so far, that bill has not gained much traction. But we keep trying, we keep trying here at the local level. I'm on the uh, state's EMS advisory committee to the legislature. We keep trying to read it, stock money away to them. From the from the legislature, which we were not as successful this year as we have been in past years, but it's still hopeful. And we're trying to leave no stern, stone left unturned. I mean, we reach out to just about every community business that we can think of and reaching out to individual donors with the help of our trustees and our volunteers. Yeah. Is money looking to close your uh, fundraising? We're hoping to break ground in fall of 2022. That's all. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Not to over that. Two months. Mm -hmm. Not a time to be breaking ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's months. Costs That's what I argued when we built this building. But mm -hmm. you said no, we're going to break ground. Other questions? No, I'm not. I I agree with you. Oh, I was the one that lost. That's what I'm saying. So I've got a few questions. Um, Ted, when he was talking about, before I forget it, the uh, grant processor that would help upgrade municipal buildings and whatnot for energy efficiencies and PPLCT, there's probably no way that some of that could get rifled through to them. Uh, are they, they're not actually a part of the municipality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a thought. Mm -hmm. uh, so which parcel, do you mind if I ask, are you building on? Is it the actual born site or 
piece of the sale property. This is a piece of the sale property. Where did you get your cost analysis? Cost analysis is run by our contractor, contract, county contractor. And when was that done? April. Um, so it would be up on the upper plateau because the town did some. Uh, Exploration there on uh, wastewater yep. uh, and whatnot for possible fire station whatnot, uh, years ago, and uh, found that the soils were very qualified for wastewater. Um, so, this will be this project will be. Done by Connor. Sure. Yeah, I was just thinking that I mean we through the, this building and even the fire station, we were able to really bring in some of the costs that were projected originally. And uh, I didn't know if there was possibility of doing something in some other area. Connor um, has agreed when they're working with folks to apply, you know, ask for impact contributions as they're working with partners mm -hmm. working for materials. So they've made that commitment to help with trying to lower that cost in terms of supplies. I just, I get my wheels spinning there. <laughs> I'll keep my kind of eye on the target here. And uh, so fall of when, 2022? <laughs> <laughs> Just to break it down a little bit, the cost of the land purchase is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The excavation on the property alone is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So before we even start building, we're five hundred thousand dollars into the project. So um, it's definitely. But in terms of location, we looked really hard and tried to find a spot that would work, and this appears to be the best fit for us. So. I'm going to ask questions. Maybe I don't know if they can be answered or not. But did Connor bought the sale property? Did they buy the sale property? You know, I'm just going to be you can't say, don't say. <laughs> Other than I will say that we are one of two projects slated for that portion. Well, one of my questions was going to be, did you get the property donated to you by SIGA? But that's <laughs> obviously, <laughs> that's obviously. <laughs> and the property is, the sale of the property is contingent upon being permanent, which we're really grateful for, because we obviously wouldn't want to buy a piece of property. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah. I'm just like, thank you. As always, <laughs> got tested many times. Very appreciative. Yeah. Um, is obviously I understand fundraising is the ultimate goal. Is there any role you would see loans of any type playing in the project, or is the goal really just to do all our current fundraising? The goal is also a question. We don't really want to have any debt under the generator. We are set with the USDA. But we don't want to touch it. It's really hard to ask donors for money to pay back a loan. Obviously. Well, it's, it's not necessarily asking donors for money to pay back the loan. Um, this project, this was a $5 million building, and, and um, you know, the loan is $300,000 because we got a million dollar grant from, from the federal government through, this, through the state. But uh, the library and the historical society raised a million dollars. So it's, it's not necessarily we're asking the donors to pay back a loan. We're asking for donors to help you build a project and you might need a loan. I understand why you don't want a mortgage. Yeah. Uh, none of us, um, it's, it's not impossible to, to get people to contribute, even if there's going to be debt. Um, so here we are in the, the so the select board's benefit, I did tell Mark and Megan when, when I met with them that um, you know we're kind of again just like we were with CD Fiber, 
outside of the normal budgeting process. And uh, you know, we're, we've got these ARPA funds. Uh, we have talked about having the public help the select board, uh, inform the select board about what things are important. And um, so I'll ask the question this way, you know, does the help that might come from the municipality have to come before you break, break ground? In other words, we go through a budget process in December and January and have town meeting in March. That's where your normal appropriation comes in. Um, and, and I'm not here to say no to our funding right now, but I think it's it's kind of a, it's a harder ask than it would be after the board goes through a process to identify what needs are in the community. So that's the question. Does it have to be before you break ground, or is there a way to? Would it stall assist? the project? I would venture to say no. Would be nice for me to advance. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's I mean our struggle is what we've been talking about the last few meetings is knowing really where our decision making power oh, lies sure. with the uh, being the legislative body being the town. Is there a direct ask or an amount ask? That you have for us or can you prepare? We've been kind of wrestling around with, with different ways to figure it out. And to be honest with you guys, you're our first stop. We're going to go and visit more town and come back various ways. But kind of divided up between percentage of, of what we do with the for the, 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 the capital now. And with the number of 100,000 came up just to keep it around. So from us, 76%. 76% of 100,000. That, that was the figure of no. yeah. 76, 78, something like that. Yeah, 76% is what Waterbury pays. Oh, right. Yeah. The amount of municipal money that funds your operations, 76% of that comes from Waterbury. So if we apply those percentages to a set amount, of, let's say 100,000. Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. it's 76%. Mm -hmm. And, and I do appreciate that you're going to talk to the other communities. One of the things that I, you know, that's why Mark sent me this email was because after we met, I said it would be helpful if you could remind me how much of your money comes from Waterbury versus the other towns because I think it's from our perspective, it's fair. And it seems from your perspective, it's fair and those sure. communities participate in this. Just to add, our operating budget annually is four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So the funding that we do bring in from the town is from the town's so appropriation is a, a portion of the funding. Mm -hmm. right. well, it's not it's not one hundred percent. Well, from my perspective, uh, it, it seems like a reasonable ask mm -hmm. and a reasonable use of ARPA funding. Um, we have, I think, decided that we don't. We don't know if we have the authority to, to allocate it right now, uh, but it's something that I'd be interested in building into the budget. Okay. It, there's more, with regard to CD fiber, there's yeah. more and more evidence that whether it's right or wrong, there's more and more evidence that other towns are, are doing what, what we, did. We, we did in terms of having this select board make a determination. Uh, and as Meg said a little bit ago, um, a significant portion of their $750,000 was the pledge. So I suppose they would be willing to accept the pledge of, you know, back throughout $100,000, 76% of that would be 75 subject to um, kind of approval. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that was going to be my suggestion is we can, you know, we, we might not feel comfortable making the commitment without putting in the budget going through town approval, but I think we could discuss among our, you know, tonight whether we feel comfortable making that pledge contingent upon, as Bill said, voter approval. Um, other thoughts or input from board members? Okay. 
Um, so then what would be the best way to move forward with that? Um, well, if you if you want to do that, I would suggest that you could make a motion that said that uh, you can start with a hundred thousand dollars and, and state that Waterbury would be willing to appropriate seventy six percent of that, subject to voter approval at town meeting, and I would also subject it to the fact that the other 24% comes from the other towns. In other words, if, if, if Duxbury and Moortown say, no, we're not going to participate, I'm not saying that we don't participate at all, but we get to talk to them about how they, they might do it otherwise, because I, I think fairness. So if you, that's how I would structure it, I guess. So I'll move that we pledge $76,000 of ARPA funding towards the construction of the new um, Waterbury uh, ambulance uh, facility, um, contingent on the participation of Duxbury at 20% and uh, Mortown at 4%. And, and subject to voter approval. And, and subject to voter approval. Move to their seconds. Thank you. Melissa second. Moved and seconded uh, for the discussion. I will say I just seconded this motion. I think it's really important. I have absolutely zero problems with hypothetically appropriating seventy-six thousand dollars to us. I think they provide an incredible service to the community, and I think this is about as close to what do we call it? One-time capital infrastructure expenses with non-ongoing maintenance. I mean, it's a it's a private nonprofit providing about as valuable of a service to our community as we can get. I have been the squeaky wheel on this mm -hmm. on one, so I'm going to keep saying it. But from the outsider perspective, I know voters approved the hundred thousand to the ISEM, but we now have a hundred thousand that went to a private nonprofit. We have the fifty k for CV fiber, and we have the seventy six that were we just made a motion on. And so I'm a little concerned about the ongoing pattern of what private nonprofit in Waterbury is going to come in with a pretty significant ask. And I think pretty soon 50 k and we've talked about creating a process and I know we haven't done that. So I guess I would say I have no reservation of this particular ask for all the reasons I just stated. But I do think to me, it just keeps coming to mind that I think, you know, we're just chipping away at this really important pot of funding without a broader conversation about what the strategic process is. And that does trouble me. So. <laughs> Again, I don't want to vote against this because I have no problem with this particular thing, but I don't love the way we're going about allocating this pretty significant resource, having not done a more comprehensive planning process. I know this, like the CD fiber, is time sensitive. And again, I think it's a very compelling case. So I'm okay with it. But I, at least personally, maybe for me, I'm going to say this would be the last ARPA allocation I personally will vote in favor of until there's a more comprehensive process. I had the same thought. I mean, as soon as it came up, and I, I, I knew you were gonna go ahead and voice it. I'll do it. <laughs> but I wasn't here. No, so whatever. But what my wheels were spinning, and this, um, I'll try to make it short, and then I think we can revisit this. I think we should and need to revisit this maybe after we take this vote. Um, but our agendas get full, and even if we think it's going to be a thirty-minute conversation, I think it could be a ten-hour conversation. So my recommendation once we go through this vote is to talk about actually scheduling a special meeting yeah, to discuss yeah, ARPA, yeah. a full two to two and a half hour meeting. I don't, I think it's irresponsible for us to think we're going to squeeze it into a regular select board meeting. So um, that's going to be my my recommendation to, to go forward. Well, I couldn't agree with Alyssa more. Mm -hmm. um, right from the get-go, I've been seeing this chipped away at and dwindling and dwindling and dwindling and and again, what better area to put it in than it would be the ambulance service. Um, but we really had no real discussion about what other things out there that are <coughs> as important uh, that we need to focus on uh, before it's all gone. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's we need to be diligent about putting it on the agenda and getting to it. I guess I'm too late. I came for our meeting too. 
Further discussions about the vote before we take the vote. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The motion passes. So, can I interrupt? Well, of course. I'm sorry. And I probably should have said this at the beginning. <laughs> I'm going to kind of ask you to add an item here, but we've been talking about it. So, um, I finally have been able to connect with the executive director of CV Fiber, Jamila Smith. Um, I emailed her right after the last meeting, proposed some times for the call. Uh, she couldn't call then, and we've emailed back and forth. She Bill, should, we me. Let, should we let them go? Is it moving oh, to a different topic? Or? Yeah, it's a different okay. topic. That like, thank you, you so much. Congratulations <laughs> on your work. It's a different topic. Yeah. So, anyway, um, at the last meeting, we talked about the CV fiber of $50,000, and I had a contract here that had green and red highlighted in, and I had asked some questions about, I didn't like the language that um, indicated that we are going to get successive uh, rounds of our funding and that we needed to pay them every time we got paid. So uh, we spoke this afternoon, um, and uh, this is uh, an issue that CB Fiber has dealt with with some other individual um, towns. So Ms. Smith is going to do two things. Uh, she's going to send me the new uh, kind of start over contract that they are uh, proposing to to make with their uh, member communities, and she's going to amend the one that had the green and red, I mean the green and yellow highlighting on that we looked at last week. So what I I'm very comfortable with what she talked about today. Um, we are going to remove any reference at all from their standard contract with regard to the number of unserved or underserved households. Uh, I shared with her my concern, and I think it was a concern of the board that, you know, where, where we currently have um, internet capability on some streets in high-end neighborhoods where people are not willing to spend their own money to connect up their driveway, it's at the right of way, it's on the public highway. Uh, I said, you know, I'm not sure that somebody who lives in a million dollar house that doesn't want to spend money to connect to the internet that's a half a mile down the driveway that they wanted to be a half a mile long is really how we want to spend that money. So they're removing this, the terminology for unserved and underserved. They're going to be targeting uh, economic necessity. Uh, so it sounds to me much more uh, in keeping to the motion that Roger made that uh, we, we, and I explained, the, the reason why we want to review the, the construction plans before you go ahead is that we'd like to see what we're doing and what we're paying for. Uh, so um, she indicated that their board had similar concerns. So what I left her with was that uh, she wasn't going to be able to get this information to me in an email until tomorrow um, that I would talk to the board tonight and ask you to allow me to go ahead and sign the contract. I can circulate it to all of you to see if there's any red flags, but I'm pretty confident given the motion that the board made, what we've talked about a couple of different times with Linda, and now with my conversation with Janiel Smith, that um, that we're ready to go ahead and, and sign this. And um, if you have concerns about that, I can say no. I'll, you know, if you want me to wait until the next meeting, I can bring it back here and you can review it. But I know that they're also a little bit interested in getting going. So. Yeah. 
No, I, I feel like uh, you understand our concerns, uh, and it sounds like you've uh, worked out a, a better wording of, of the new contract. So I feel like uh, we should give you the authority to move forward with that uh, with that letter of agreement. Yeah, I'm right on board. With it. We've been looking out for our best interest when it comes to the value of this dollar. We're more appropriately should go. If you could just note that in the minutes by consensus, so we don't have to make them. I don't okay. care. What's the by consensus? If you that, if it's, you can oh, okay, I'll move, move <laughs> that we uh, I'll authorize Bill to uh, sign this new agreement that he's just described uh, with CD5. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you for letting me sneak that in. Mm -hmm. um, and to follow up, so we had gotten an email from Linda that Janiel was looking to have a meeting with you, or was that just to talk about the contract? Well, I think the email from Linda was that Janiel and I have been but, going back and yeah, forth, okay. and she sent me an email on Friday suggesting that she could talk to me today sometime okay. and I I was off Friday. I was out of state. I did see the email and then there were a number of things that took up my time. So I didn't see even <laughs> her email until late in the day today. But we did talk at, at the end of the I day. I just wanted to make sure that was kind of the same same thing before. No, I, so think I, Linda, I think Linda is just trying not to <laughs> let it slip through the cracks. So thank you. Uh, Linda, did you have more or did that cover it? <laughs> No, I just want to thank everybody. Um, I'm glad. No, I got an email from Jimmy Janiel about oh six thirty tonight that said Bill indicated that tonight he'd seek approval to sign the agreement. So I'm pa been patiently waiting through the entire select board meeting because <laughs> I didn't see it on the agenda either. So I would like to thank Bill for putting it up for for approval tonight. It's it's a, um, extremely wonderful. I think thank you so much to the select board for doing this. Um, I have one question I'd like to ask because I'd like to go home if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, the VLCT.org, uh, they have uh, training on cybersecurity. I'm interested in taking the training on cybersecurity. Do I have to get permission from select board or something to take this? I am a elected official as a justice of the peace. I think it's very relevant to what I'm doing with CV fiber. I have background, by the way, in cybersecurity, but I just think a brush up would be good for me. I think uh, my recommendation, Linda, is that CV fiber is a municipality. I would ask you to ask Janelle, Janelle Smith to reach out to the LCT and see if you CV Fiber can become uh, a member of VLCT. It's a, you're a municipal organization. And um, I think that is a better, uh, you're, you're not really a municipal official. A justice of the peace is, is not a municipal official. Oh, I guess he, I thought he said elected officials. No, did I mishear him tonight? Ted. Yeah, but I'll I'll check to see if that is something that we can let you do. But a, the justice of the peace is not a standard elected official. Um, you don't have oh, any. I thought I was on the ballot. <laughs> you don't have authority for any municipal functions except helping to run an election, I guess. That sounds like a municipal function to me, Bill. Thank you very much. I will talk to Janelle about it. Is there a cost to the town to take this training? Usually they have a cost associated, yes. Okay. I'll find out if Justice and Peace are eligible. Okay, and I'll ask Janelle. Thank you very much for your time you and for that. the approval. Mm -hmm. Have a great Thank night, you guys. Thank you. All right. Um, is there any benefit to switching these agenda items and then to let Skip go? Well, I think 
you yeah. can give while well, you can give the first yeah, one. I, I, okay. I, I don't think that it's going to be any benefit. Sure. Okay. Um, update on manager search process and Skip, I'll have you help me fill in anything I might miss. Um, so something I want to point out is, and with thanks to Alyssa, is um, the minutes are posted on the website after our uh, search committee meetings, but they haven't been distributed to the whole board, and that's an oversight because I think it's a lot easier if we just email them to all of you. So um, I think that'll be the received any either. best practice going forward. Okay. They've been on the website. I think it's just the first meeting. Oh, okay. So we're not up to date. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. So that is, um, so we'll talk about that and we'll remedy that. And thanks for your patience as we, you know, correct our errors. Um, uh, I have, I give a select board, uh, our lovely graphs. These are the results. Um, and I have an extra, oh, I gave a skip one. Um, basically, it's pretty crude. It's very simple. It's just highlighting the um, top choices from the survey from um, community members. I think what's, what's extra interesting is just the other responses that we got. So it's worth just reading through. The top two were the updating and modernizing zoning regulations to support housing and economic development and uh, road maintenance. Those two were, were highly, highly ranked in first and second place and stood out. Um, so I think that's um, for everyone's consideration as we decide what to submit to Rec as those um, priorities to put in the town profile. Um, How many responses do we get? You know, I will let you know that. It's in the, um, I shared a link just today, right before the meeting. So it's in there and you'll have all the numbers and then follow up with questions. And I'm, I'm sorry, I got, you know, just Friday was the deadline and I did not do this till today. So that's where we're at. Um, so, um, yeah, so we do need to decide both between us and UFAD or as a committee what we want to submit to Rick. Um, as those priorities, but I wanted to solicit input from you all before, you know, just speaking with the committee. Can there be more than just the two? Yeah, I think he said, I think it was top three is what he said. Um, and it doesn't need to be specifically these, like we can incorporate just one of these, but we wanted to give, you know, at least the opportunity for folks to chime in. So what would have been the third one? Uh, the third of these, the third top. <clears throat> no, that's okay. I guess because I sent it just now. I believe it was the ARPA allocating ARPA funds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And we don't need to make that decision today. Um, what, what I can do is follow up. I sent you the email with this link, but what I can do is follow up and ask individually. I don't know. I just, we, you know, we want to move forward and I don't know how to best do it to submit those to him. Can we uh, read through this? Yeah. Yeah. Different for me to, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And then uh, just send your comments. That's perfect. Okay. Um, so another note is that the, so last the last committee meeting we had, um, we approved the final draft of the job descriptions. They were separate job descriptions, town and EFUD. Um, Right now, they are listed on the website. Rick asked me to submit them to Carla to put on the website so that when the advertisements are officially published, it'll link to those job descriptions because like an ad on the internet is not going to have a full job, multi-page job description. It's going to have a link to the website. Right now, I think it just says like a generic check back for how to get in touch because those ads aren't out. Once the actual ads are out, it will have, I think it's Rick that the, solicitations go to. So just to flag, the mm -hmm. ads are out. So I don't oh, want to be the person that I, did, I was on a seven day day? job yeah. no, three days ago. Okay. So I actually talked to, I emailed Mike and left a message. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. it sounds like he was on vacation, but I do want to flag, there's a seven day okay. job advertisement for the Water Brain Municipal Manager. 
And then when you go to the town website, it's the two posts per lab okay. for a manager and EFA manager. There isn't information on where it should be. There's not. Yet, right? It just says okay. more information is coming. So I think it's pretty important you get that remedy ASAP because it's being advertised out in the world and I think isn't quite complete and up to date. So I don't know whose responsibility that is. Like I said, I flagged it to Mark tonight because um, I hadn't been involved, but okay. I saw some of these. Job we have that date so for the it. ads going I out. To them, but, I mean, not I, no, no, it, it must have like just been a miscommunication yeah. of where it linked to. But my concern was that a Joe Schmo off the street, I believe it's linking to waterbrainuti.com, our homepage mm -hmm. of the municipal website, which does have that stand in update. Yeah. But does the ad have contact information? Did you see that? I think it's the C website for additional information. Okay. I didn't see the print one, it was just the online one. Um, but it says water rain municipal manager and then of course it doesn't two. say how to submit an application right and that's not included in the text of the job description or in a general blurb on the town website and then there's also two job descriptions for manager and EFA and EFA manager both currently posted so that team is also the JDs are separate. separate the ads will be an ad for one position um so there was a date that was chosen to publish the ads. I don't have that in front of me. It would be in those meeting okay. minutes. So I missed that. that. The concern is just that it's under the Yeah, I understand. And I will follow up on that, like how to submit. So can I ask a stupid question? It's probably not stupid. Yeah. <laughs> um, was VLCT supposed to be the one that was supposed to be doing the advertising yeah. when everything got ready? And so that it was complete before it got put out. Yes. So. So I need to follow up with. So Rick is the person. Don't know. <laughs> I don't have. I don't have an answer to that. Yeah. So unless you do, skip. No. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna have to follow up with Rick. <clears throat> Are candidates allowed to apply for one independent of the other? It turns out I don't know the answer to any questions because my assumption is no, but I don't, I'm not going to say that with authority because I feel confused by the lack of clear communication. So yeah, I would hope that that could get clarified pretty quickly. I don't think EFUD wants to pay for their own manager, do they? I said, I don't think EFUD wants to pay for their own manager, do they? Two job descriptions for the municipal manager. And within the municipality, well, there's two municipalities. The profile describes that there's two, two specific jobs requirements that we're filling. And it's for, for one but position. For one, 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 one. It's designed as a one single position, but there are distinct responsibilities here and distinct responsibilities there. Yeah. Okay. But clarity when you're looking. I will follow up with Rick personally. I will include Mike because Mike has been, in theory, he volunteered to be the person to liaise between the board and the committee. Obviously, that communication is not going well, just in terms in general. So I will reach out to Rick and include Mike and follow up. Thank you. That is what. Uh, and I would just say I totally appreciate it. And again, I think it's yeah, not. So I think well. it's been very clear and intentional. So I don't want to give the impression like no, it's not. Right. It's frustrating because we're at the point where things are starting to happen, and that's the most important point to be able to. No, right. So happening. I think it's really clear. I just and and I did just pull it up so just okay. so folks know. Yeah, it's yeah. Seven days, and it um, I says a detailed job description. It's available by clicking the web. Web link icon, whatever you call that above, hold oh, please. Um, and it's going to the news feed on the town website right now. Um, and it's saying that receipt to appoint um, municipal manager and district manager. So again, I think just that explanation text of the little see the two right. So in the ad, there's no um, how to submit an application. Well, I think it does let you submit an application okay. for seven days jobs. Okay. I, like, actually, I've seen ads through seven days jobs. I haven't used their own platform to apply personally. I've heard through the grapevine there was some applicants, so somebody's figured out. Yeah, it says to apply for this job, log in slash register on this a seven days okay. a seven days job. Okay. Click apply for button. Um, okay, that's helpful. Thank you. That's what I need to know. When you contact Rick, you can ask him uh, if 
is advertised in the ICMA newsletter. The only reason I ask is because I get the ICMA newsletter as I'm a member, and the most recent uh, newsletter went out last week, and the water job wasn't mm -hmm. advertised. Yet. We have, I don't. So it may have. Yeah. You may have gotten it in, you know, a day later for that deadline, yeah. but. It, it should be in that publication. Okay. It's, yeah, we have a list of all the places where the ad is going to be placed. I don't have the link. Like, I don't have I'm, right I'm, I'm sure yeah. I remember from reading an email from Rick that that was one place mm -hmm. that it's supposed to go, but it has not appeared. Okay. Yeah. Super. We'll remedy that. Um, more questions that I can't answer? <laughs> <laughs> no, I really, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Profile is secondary, and it will be a really beautiful yeah. follow up piece yeah. informed by a comprehensive town yeah. public input survey. To yeah, input this is just one task to do here. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, we will move forward. Discussion of water system. That's you, sir. Uh, well, thank you for entertaining me here. <laughs> Say that again. Reminds me of days of being a trustee. Um, I put together a uh, PowerPoint to tell this story. I went over it with Woody this afternoon. And if I talk fast, I can get through it in 45 minutes, oh. but it's more likely to be an hour. Um, so if you wanted to defer and come back at another time, I'd be glad to do that, or we can proceed there. I don't think we've gotten out here before 10 o'clock. Uh, or not. Um, so we're at the very bottom to 77%. Let's yeah. zoom that icon to the left. That kind of looks... Yeah, yeah. 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 So are we... Um, we good with an hour presentation? Yeah. Or So now you should just leave the arrow through, unless you don't want that. But it made it full time. Oh, okay. Thank you. What's that? An hour. So this is an hour presentation. And so Skip made the offer of continuing tonight as scheduled, though off schedule or a reschedule. Coming back at some other time when you're kind of true. Well, how significant is it? Is there is there some deadlines that we've got to meet, or is it just a presentation? No, it's just informational for the, the trouble is this. Was supposed to be a short meeting. It's a fairly <laughs> straightforward short agenda. Right. right. And this was also scheduled for 25 minutes. Well, I guess but my question, like 60 minutes, so my that's question okay. to you is any idea what, you have no clue what the next agenda is going to include as far as, or do we just, or do we just slot it in for? The There's not one? much on the next one. Yeah. And then if we do schedule it in for the next one, let's make sure we put an hour yeah. versus 25 minutes. Yeah, to give that time frame. And uh, Woody and I have worked on it most of uh, today, kind of back and forth, collecting stuff. I worked on it from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I had a lot more fun working on it Saturday and Sunday, <laughs> listening to the Red Sox Yankees <laughs> game than I did on Friday. Uh, but there's a lot of information here. And from my perspective, you really need to know the history of the water system to appreciate how we got to where we are today. So that's my pitch. I mean, I don't care either way. It's... Sounds like it might be raining hard outside, so you might just want to. Okay. <laughs> I'm happy to. Okay. I want you to like. Can I? Okay. Let's. Rock and roll then. I'm gonna not be good, but I have to go to the bathroom. So you can start and I'll be right back. What if we're doing a late night presentation? Who doesn't watch it? We got the next. Oh, close. That one over. I didn't know we were going till 10 p.m., but sometimes they are going to be to be able 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 to be able
You can start, yeah. 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 Like that is a split. Skip, you can start. Mm -hmm. well, okay, yeah, yeah, the green light, Skip. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I can't tell. Can they see yeah. our screen? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, a little bit of a background. Yeah. I wanted to. Mm -hmm. I said my hand goes up. Oh, good. What about snacks? I was going to give you a 30 second background on my um, situation to give you the perspective of what I have here that I grew up in Waterbury Village, walked to school four times a day for 12 years, went to Northeastern University, had a degree in civil engineering, graduate school in sanitary engineering, got a job with the uh, Agency of Environmental Conservation for 39 years, I lived in Waterbury Center for 10 years from 69 to 79 and moved back to the village and been here all that time. So that's my perspective on uh, this water system and appreciate it. I chose this slide to open as uh, if you knew about the water system, you stood at Rusty Parker Park, which is on the right. And you look over the well house, you can see Mount Hunger, which is where the start of the water for the Waterbury water system comes from. The other place that you can see Mount Hunger at the same perspective is down in the hospital green, looking over the uh, Joel Baker house there, you can see Mount Hunger thing. Uh, next slide. Um, Mount Hunger is elevation 3540. The elevation of Main Street is 428. So that's the uh, elevation the water travels that when you turn on the faucet in Waterbury that you uh, are drinking. Next. Uh, from my perspective, this water system is the most critical and the oldest of the utilities in Waterbury. And in 1896, they constructed this water system. I think this is the most important, fourth most important event in making Waterbury what we enjoy today. Next. Um, my first event is Arthur Thatcher from uh, New Milford when he came I to- I, I can't see the presentation on the Zoom. Are you guys going through the slideshow right now or? Yeah, I just I couldn't see the slideshow presentation on Zoom. Okay, I don't know if on. that. Hold on. Just do it the way I was doing it before. Carla. Hold on, Glenn. Just like trying to get back in. That should, oh, that should, yeah. That was it. Let's try that one more time. Um, oh wait, so that's the big, that's the presentation mode one right there. That's when I was right. just in, so you couldn't see. Um, okay. No, right. Yeah, just do this one. Yeah, I do not. Okay. They can see it as well or not. Can you see it? I mean, I, I can see the first oh, yeah, slide. On I just don't be in presentation mode. We might not be able to. I gotta close. This one. I gotta close. Which one was the presentation? This one. The black one. Mm -hmm. I close this one. I gotta close this one. This gave you one to get ready. Um, in the search, I'm afraid if I do that, I'll shut down the whole Zoom meeting or something. Yeah, I can that. Um, I think that's just, this is just. Well, if you minimize it, you'll see what it is. Oh, right click. Do you want it? You're not presenting. Right click. 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 Right
So now you can say share and we want to ship work again. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. All right. Yes. Yeah, there you go. Okay. I thought that might have started. Great, thank you. Do you see it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So these are the four events that I think uh one of our eight Archer Thatcher, and he uh, was one of the original owners in New Belfort, Connecticut. He was the first town clerk of Waterbury, and our rec these records from Connecticut are in our vault. And he came to Waterbury in 18, 1782 to survey it. Um, that's just the start. Uh, James Myers settled in 8, 1783, and then the railroad came through in 1849, which uh, really changed the development of Waterbury. And then the water system in 1896, the system of pipes and storage on Blush Hill that provided constant pressure and a system of fire hydrants that are important to the fire protection. Next. In uh, 1895, they approved construction of this system with the surface water intakes and the springs that were six miles from the village up on Mount Hunger. He had a 500,000 gallon storage tank on Blush Hill that was 230 feet above the village that provided 100 pounds pressure constantly in the village. That was a great design and it didn't involve pumping to provide the pressure designed by uh, Joel Foster, who was a superintendent of water in Mount Gilear, and is built by uh, L. Taylor of Worcester, Mass. And much of the labor whoops, Sorry. was provided by Italian immigrants that ex excavated all of the trenches by hand. Mm -hmm. um, some 12 miles of trench, even though it's six miles away, there were multiple pipes at uh, different times. It cost 32000 at that time, which is $1.1 million in today's dollars. And they were designing it for 225,000 gallons back in 1895. This is a little profile of uh, hand drawn with my C.C. <laughs> Warren ruler this morning from uh, Elevations. What he gave me that it's the intakes in these two brooks is around. 1,200 feet, we have a stilling basin at 1,100, elevation 1,158. The water plant today is at elevation 989, and then on Blush Hill is 685 is our reservoir and our main street at 628. Um, so water is coming downhill. That's the profile that was in 1895, and it's still our profile today. Next. And before the water system was constructed, the village had two small private systems um, that couldn't provide fire protection or anything. Uh, one of the primary purposes, I think, was to provide fire protection in 1895. That water system led to uh, granite cutting business, the stone sheds expanding in Waterbury and Milk uh, handling creameries were a big business in Waterbury that they were shipping three car loads of milk to Boston a day. The next major improvement that they did was the gravel pack well on the park that they built and uh, constructed in 1938. And they had just purchased the park from the railroad in 1929. And over the years. Park? Yeah, Roger. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Rusty Parker Park. <laughs> um, and they've been other upgrades of transmission lines and a micro strainer in 1974 that was removing sticks and leaves. Next. This is the uh, park well built in uh, 
1938, it was a gravel packed well. They drilled test wells, probably 17 to 20 test wells all over Waterbury. This is the only one that developed the water source that they wanted. Um, it's about uh, 200,000 gallons a day. Um, the well was uh, 22 feet deep and the pump was on the second floor because of the uh, flood protections. The pump went, uh, took it in and out of through the roof, um, which I think uh, when we gave the park building to the rotary, they had to pull that uh, well out through the roof. Um, they had just purchased the park in 1929 from the railroad. Well, next. The next day, uh, the commissioners installed a micro strainer. You can see it on the right. Um, the young fellow uh, looking at the mi micro strainer, uh, would he uh, guess right that that was our uh, young youthful uh, town manager, Alec Tuscany, looking at the uh, micro strainer. And mm -hmm. on the left, I've got it reversed. On the right, that's where. Uh, the micro strainer on the yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> right and left. On the right is the building that it's located in, built in 19, uh, well, the stilling basin is behind it in 1924. And I think they built that building to put the micro strainer in. It's still there today, used as storage. Uh, next. In uh, March of 1998, it was a new idiot. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, a new start in Waterbury for the Water Department, Bill Shepluck began as our town and village manager, and I was elected a water commissioner along with Chuck Magnus. The other water commissioner was Bob O'Brien. And all is well till July when we had a drought, and it required that we turned on this park well that we just talked about. The newspaper said it was the first time in 17 years. I didn't remember that, but it could be true. And our first sample from that park well showed contamination with benzene, which is evidence of contamination from gasoline. Um, and we had to issue a boil water order to reduce benzene below the safe level. We res resorted to turning on the demerit well, which is another well that we had as backup connected to the system by an iron and manganese. Um, you let it set for a couple hours and it all rusty. Um, we had to shut the park well off and then we did a um, test to uh, run it for uh, 48 hours, I think, to check for the levels of benzene, which increased as we ran it. The wasted water went into a storm drain in front of the railroad station, which flooded out our wastewater system. <laughs> Um, so that was the first few months of 88, but the beginning of the improvements to the water system that we have today. And we were also told by the state that during that drought that we could not connect any new, um, no new connections could be made to the system to rectify these problems. Yes, we had many conversations with the Department of Health and things uh, at that time. Um, we immediately began working with Tom Nesbitt at Dufresne Henry, which was the village engineers at the time, and the Wagner Hydro Illinois, the hydrogeologists, to design a water treatment system and develop uh, new groundwater sources. Um, we secured an option on 35 acres from Jack Sweet up there, called Sweetsfield now. And I think it was $150,000 that we paid for it. Uh, I didn't, couldn't find that in the village records. Um, we use fracture trace analysis, analysis and dowsing. Um, we located three productive well sites um, that we eventually drilled on. Um, there's a story of uh, Mike Grace and I went up to the Dowser Society in Danville and he doused over a map with a uh, pending um, said we get 56 gallons a day from a well that was 89 feet. Woody found the original map today that Mike and I had had when we 
went up to the Dowser Society. Um, 56 gallons a minute? 56 gallons a minute. So, um, the NOSH drilled three wells in Sweetsfield where we did the fracture trace analysis. Um, they all turned out well. And we drilled in the old spring adjacent to the Tyler Brook in the water field shed, which turned out to be the best well of all. And uh, with these new water sources, we had plans for a water treatment system upgrade. And they were approved in January 1990. The village voters approved a bond vote for $4.136 million in a total project cost of $7,595 million. And we got $3,459 million million dollars in state and federal grants. Mm -hmm. um, this is the water treatment plant. It was uh, started uh, operating in uh, 92, um, dedicated to Earl Town, who was the longtime uh, water superintendent um, in August of 80, August 80, 92, we did that next. And uh, these are the features from the uh, dedication pamphlet that we had that, uh, you know, the filtration system, uh, we had a, uh, um, and the flocculation and clarification filtration and uh, removes turbidity, bacteria, color, and odor and organics and uh, all these other things. Um, the commissioners at the time wanted to have steel tanks that you didn't have to take down every 10 years and paint. And uh, we appealed to the commissioner. We finally allowed to have the stainless steel tanks that we haven't had to do any maintenance on. Uh, so, uh, yeah. these are the officials and representatives at the time. Uh, the plant was. Uh, mm -hmm. so, Dedicated there. Uh, the trustees, Jeff Kilgore, ever copy, and Mickey Fay, and Mike Grace, our superintendent, and Woody was uh, the assistant, um, and all the uh, consultants that we had. Next. These are the sources that are approved in our current water permit. Um, you can see Tyler and Marion Brook dams were some of the were the original sources in 1895, and then the list of the springs um, that those fellows that uh, purchased and had been piped in the, the uh, system all these years. Um, as you'll see, uh, wells two, three, and four were in Sweetsfield. We built separate pipes, so their pipe down to the water treatment plant um, into the clear well that we don't have to run those through the water treatment plant, which gives us backup water supply sources, both the surface water and the wells at the time. Uh, so our approved capacity, if you add those up, is uh, the wells add up to the 261 gallons a minute, which is 375 gallons a day. And then, uh, there's the additional 325 is the well that was in the old spring, uh, the biggest well of all there. They were allowing us 30 gallons a minute from the uh, Tyler Brook and Marion Brook in a, in a drought period. That's the low flow that they authorize. Uh, next. Hey, Skip, is that before the 2014 ANR study that suggested the uh, Brook over on Waterworks Road is uh, below um, permissible uh, levels for stream habitat or recommended levels, I should say, or even, you know, um, I guess, uh, you know, passing levels. Do you know what I'm talking about? The, the, uh, the spring, I think it's the first gate uh, in the Waterworks headed north. I... Didn't really hear all he asked, but those are safe flows for drinking water supplies. So, Glenn, what was the year you were asking about? 
Well, I think the report was done in 2014 by a and It's We don't have to get into it now. I just was curious. Thanks. Uh, don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, the treatment components and things here is uh, the water treatment plan is uh, with the filters and things is approved for 350 gallons a minute at uh, 500 four thousand gallons a day with one filter we have two filters one's a backup um, we also add fluoride to the water for dental benefits as well as uh, chlorination and things and this is where it says you know we can uh, pump well two well three and well four directly into the treatment plant uh, the finished water tank Next. and these are the samplings that we're required to do for the uh, system uh, bacteria sampling we have a wet and copper sampling plan disinfection byproducts and things a surf source protection area plan for the uh, wells and uh, surface water up in the waterworks there um, during the 1991 construction um, there was a fatality of one of the construction workers a young lady who was uh, accidentally electrocuted on Barnes Hill. Uh, she was a flagger. She drove here from Richmond and she was helping uh, direct a pipe that was being lowered into the trench. And uh, the excavator got either touched the electrical wire or got too close to it and it arced. And unfortunately, uh, she was electrocuted. So. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> this doesn't show up too well, uh, <laughs> but the two young men <laughs> in there are Mike, Grace, and Woody. This is right after, I think, the, you can see the filtration tanks on your left here. I think that's the chlorination bench on the right there, Woody, or correct uh, thing. So uh, next, this is Mike, Grace, in the treatment plant office, and uh, Mike and Woody, uh, Woody thought they were getting ready to do a uh, talk for school kids showing how you tap the water line, buckets of the filter media uh, there to show the kids and tell them uh, how the system works. They've had numerous uh, class uh, trips up there to hear about the water system. So. Um, this is one of the expansions of the system for the loose system with a uh, system of springs up on uh, coming off Loomis Hill there that had been there for years. Uh, they had about 125 customers. They were ordered by the health department to uh, correct the system. They were on spring and for years, we had supplemented their uh, water system by a connection between the village pipe and uh, the loose pipe. Uh, it wasn't adequate and uh, they were ordered to do something. We began talking with the uh, David Loose, the owner of the system at the time. And uh, we agreed to uh, connect them to the system but the, the user shouldn't pay for the construction. So we came up with a uh, plan that the loose customers would connect to the system, but they paid for that construction cost. And it turned out to be $27.50 per cost quarter that they pay us. But the village bonded for this construction cost. Um, because the village at the time had a lower average income and the income, average income of the people determined the interest rate that Farmer's Home would let you borrow money. Uh, next slide. Oh, uh, anyway, we bonded for a hundred and, can you go back to that one? I mean, you do. Um, oh yeah, up top. We bonded for $170,000. The total project cost was $582,000. So grants and things covered that the 
additional construction. Cost. And that's what the town was an eligible for the grants. I mean, the interest rate was probably lower, but the town would not be eligible for those grants if the town had done that job. Oh, okay. so the village did the bonding, and that is all owned by the EFUD Philip district now. That the system turned over all the all of that to the village in exchange for that uh, upgrade. Um, the other system we took over, yeah, yeah, we did take over. We worked with in 1997 was the Duxbury workout system, which was in a similar situation to which the loose system was. They were under orders at inadequate pipes and a water supply. Uh, we talked with them. They purchased a uh, capacity from the village and uh, they formed this fire district. They bonded for their own uh, funds to construct the system. I don't have their uh, dollars that they uh, did that. And uh, they paid off their bond. And uh, now uh, we've been uh, sending their bills. They pay us a fee. Um, for their bills and things that pay the town our water rate plus an extra fee that goes to Duxbury Port Town. And they pay us to do the maintenance on that system. Um, and they're in the process of talking to the attorney and how they may give all their assets to the EFUD and we would take over that line, own them, and they would be paying the same rate as the uh, Village customers, which include operation and maintenance. Um, so that may happen sometime this year. Um, this is a map of Sweetsfield that we purchased and shows the three wells that we um, drilled and located by Dowsers and uh, fracture trace analysis. Uh, Do you own the property or are you just a little? Do you own the property? Yeah, we, we bought it from uh, Tom Sweet's father, Jack Sweet, for okay. hundred and fifty thousand thousand dollars uh, back in uh, 88, 89. Mm -hmm. So the three wells, you can see one at the back was uh, 450 feet deep, 75 gallons a minute. Well, two, 383 feet deep and 50 gallons a minute. Another well four, which is 500 gallons a minute and 135 gallons. Um, and you can see the solar array um, that we're going to talk about in a minute um, that was uh, built there. This is a uh, aerial photo map of Sweetsfield. I'm not sure the date, but the the solar array is there. You can see the roads and, uh, around there. Uh, next. Oh, maybe I just missed um, This is well one that was drilled in a spring location, high yield spring. Um, that when we first looked at it, there was a little doghouse there and it was had a lot of water there. So we, the fracture trace showed that it was a uh, potential hollow yield site. We drilled a 600 foot deep well there that has a capacity of 325 gallons a minute. Mm -hmm. We drilled an eight inch diameter well and we put in the biggest pump that we could get and we couldn't pump all the water. Mm -hmm. We should have drilled a 10 inch well. Uh, and Woody uh, checked out that this is next to the Tyler Brook Dam at an elevation about 1,300 feet with a well 600 feet deep. The bottom of that well goes down to where TJ store at the little park at Waterbury Center is. That's the bottom of the well. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, dams on the uh, two streams that we take water from. Um, I thought this was the Marion Brook Dam, but Woody corrected me that it's the Tyler Brook Dam. Uh, 
where the uh, water is coming in up here, the intakes are kind of at the far end where the intake screens are. We now have signs up that say no swimming in case uh, any of the hikers or things wanted to take a dip <laughs> in the cool water. Um, the stream flow comes in and overflows out and we take a pipe full there. Um, things now, um, there's no overflow because all of the water is being taken up um, for water treatment here. Next, this is the other dam. They're pretty similar. But when Skip says now there's no overflow because it's all being taken up for water, there's no overflow because it's been dry. And yeah, I was in that. In, in, in wetter times, and in, in worse times, that that box fills up, water goes down the pipe, but there's still an overflow there. But when it's dry, there's no water. So would you be getting any water out of it now? Oh yeah. That the picture on the left there is the water coming in that we're taking yep. down to the uh, treatment plant. So I don't there's can, you, can, can, you, can you explain the type? Uh, regulated water flow that these streams are? The type of regulated water flow? Yeah, these are mapped uh, in the state ANR database is a specific type, I believe it's type F, uh, regulated flow water, something to that effect. You, Skip, are you familiar with that? Did you hear the question? It's asking if I'm familiar with the type of regulated water flow designated by AMR? Uh, we're regulated out of the water system. I, I don't know any other. Yeah, the, the stream classification is specifically a regulated flow, uh, which is very different than any other uh, flow of any other river or stream. Just, just to give you guys the select board a heads up on that. So, sorry. Um, next. This is a photo of Sweets Field today. Um, you can see the solar array um, that's there. Uh, the 500,000 kilowatt solar array we built in uh, Sweden, built the uh, Green Lantern, built in December of 2014 and went online. Uh, we get annual income of about $11,000 in electricity and the 500 a $5,000 lease payment and the three wells. Um, when we uh, built the system too, we buried all the power lines and you don't see any power lines in the picture there. And, uh, and every municipal electric meter um, and EFUD gets electricity mm -hmm. on that. And uh, so the five thousand dollar lease, yeah. five thousand dollar lease is to EFUD goes to the water department because they own the land. Oh, okay. That the lease is uh, the array was built on village property, so the village gets the lease payment, but the electricity that gets generated, um, you know, all of the electricity pretty much is used in the municipal meters, but because the municipality doesn't own the array, uh, you know, we have to pay 95% of the credits that are generated to the company that owns the array. Uh, does Green Lantern own the array or? Uh... They, they've sold it. It's sold twice since they bought it. Okay, so it's owned by, by utility. Uh, yeah, somebody out of Colorado. There are periods of time in the in the lease where the EFUD has the ability to, to buy it at a predetermined rate. Mm -hmm. and after seven years, I think after 14 years, and, and then at the end, they're responsible for taking it down. They still own it if it, you know, if it ceases to operate. But right now, you know, the when it was built. Uh, I forgot what the cost of it was, but neither the town nor the, nor the village was in a position to, to build it at that time. It was, 
it was it was one of the projects that came out of the whole uh, FEMA charrette after after uh -huh. Irene and uh, the community didn't have the money to do that. Uh, yeah, the back to that. We had to uh, run three phase power from down in the center of some way all the way up Loomis Hill to uh, run the wells and things. So that was another um, thing we had to do that upgraded the electrical lines all the way up there. So, yeah. Um, things that kind of uh, out of order here or something, but anyway, this is. Um, I was talking about uh, potential or not potential, but additions, significant additions to the water system to lose customers, the uh, um, Duxbury Moortown customers. This is Donald Peck, who uh, in 2009 he paid to run extend an eight inch line up to his mobile home park where he had 80 units uh, that he uh, paid a uh, connection fee and connected up and uh, extending it further up Neal and Flats that the uh, adjacent properties benefit from the hydrants and things there for fire protection. Um, this is also the system that was part of uh, what was proposed by Bill that uh, you know, if we transferred the UDAG money, um, get some ARPA funds to upgrade his uh, water system, which um, probably needs to win. And we talked about, uh, you know, uh, housing, uh, affordable housing things that the 80 units in this mobile home park probably fit that category and things. But this wasn't something upgrading uh, his. Uh, internal park system that we would um, expect the users of the system to, to pay for. So um, that ARPA money would have helped. And if you still want to do something later on with it, we'd be glad to work with him. And there may be grants and things uh, for mobile home parks and things. So anyway, um, next, we also have a second in line. We have a inline hydro system in Colbyville Vault where the water moving through the pipe turns the turbine and generates uh, electricity. We got a $60,000 grant from GMP to install it. What he thought it cost about $120,000 to put in. Um, so kind of a unique uh, situation. It needs to be uh, the pipe sizes going into it need to be extended to make it uh, work uh, as it intended, but uh, it is producing some electricity today. Or... Well, it's very little now, but once that pipe just above the arrow gets upgraded, the hope is it comes closer to the four feet. Is that, is that from the dam that's at Colby Hill there? Um, it's actually, no, this is actually on Guffle Road, uh, right okay. just up from Chris's house. Um, so it serves just as an in right in on the day, essentially. Oh, so it's, a, it's basically a pressure reducing vault. Okay, where we've got a front of front of the water it's coming down like a water plant. Uh, we've got a couple of these where we step the pressure down because right. if we didn't do it, we would go blowing out water heaters and everything else, even though most people are told in those areas to have their own pressure reducing system. And because it's a mechanical system to reduce the pressure, you can put a turbine in there right. and yeah, it doesn't go over the system. And the electricity from this was supposed to go to the ice center? That's correct. So, um, and this is uh, the land that the uh, e flood owns in uh, Stowe. Well, most of it's in Stowe. It's the waterworks. It's 488 acres in Stowe um, that was purchased. I didn't look up the purchase, but it must have been purchased uh, many years ago, maybe in the 1890 uh, period there. Um, I've outlined the waterworks road, which if you're going up, uh, you know, Barnes. 
uh, Suma Hilling going through over to Barnesville that's there. Uh, the town line for Stowe is, uh, we showed that there. Um, the Tyler Dam and the Merriam Dams are where the intakes were. And uh, just beyond the Tyler Dam, there's a little, well, looks red to me. Dothic is the well one that's 600 feet deep. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, hey, is that the one that's on my property, Skip? No. All right, which one's the square box on my property? Because that's no longer. But we could we could talk about it later. Sorry to interrupt. It's Glenn Anderson wanting to know where the spring on his property is. Yeah, I'm just it's all right. We don't have to talk about this now. I'm just at sort of I'm seeing mapping on here and I've had it before where you know the Stowe Land Trust is like in the staying connected corridor have like literally mapped wildlife quarters, new ones across my property because of the solar development in the sweets field um, and all of the things that have pushed the ancient corridor that migrates between the Green Mountains and the Worcesters more and more onto our property. So that's why we're going to court uh, in the environmental court. That's why we're in there um, now. So hopefully maybe there's a, a compromise where we could protect some property uh, and we don't have to like fight, but you know, I just want to make sure that you guys understand that if it appears on the map, that's something I, I just, I have a problem with. So, thanks. This is only a map of the watershed in, in Stull. It, it wasn't, it didn't include, uh, you know, the other property there. So, um, okay, great. I appreciate it. I'll, I'll, I'll bump out now here. Stay guys. Bye. Can you go back to that? Oops, sorry, this, I just cover the mouse and it moves. Um, and when we, I couldn't find how much we pay in property taxes to stole there, but I said, go ahead. We paid about $16,000 to Waterbury and Stowe in 2021. And uh, when we started out, we, this is in a current use plan. We have a forestry management plan um, for this. We loved it according to the plan things. And when we first started out, because it's in the town of Stowe, the current use plan, we were charged as fair market value for it. And I think we got that changed in the legislature. Yeah. We now can take credit for the current use of the property that the taxes are reduced in Stowe as a result of this. So um, until about 20 years ago, the state's current use law did not allow municipalities to take advantage of it. And that's not saved us a lot of money. Uh, next. So, this is the current system. Um, we have 700,000 gallons of storage up on Barnes Hill and 1.4 million gallons of storage on Blush Hill. A lot of that is for fire protection. Uh, the system has 130 hydrants on it. Um, the pipe sizes and our, uh, the storage uh, hydrants can produce 3,000 gallons a minute to fight fire. What do you think? We have uh, hydrants that produce more than that. They're much more than what the uh, fire pumper trucks can handle. So we're uh, you know, the highest rated uh, water system in terms of that. Um, Waterbury has, I believe, the highest insurance uh, rating that you can have, both due to the water system and the equipment and the manpower of the fire department, which is a big uh, savings and benefit to uh, the people when you're close to the system and they're looking at your insurance uh, rates and things. And, but the cost of Maintaining this system is all borne by the users, even though others off that aren't on the system do benefit from it here. So next, um, in 88, when uh, Bill took over and uh, I was elected, our water department budget that year was $200,000. And the water department budget for 2022, um, was uh, 
$1,307,990 that Bill had a million dollar capital outlay in there, which I wasn't sure what that was meant to be. Well, that would have been the $600,000 from the alpha funds that would have gone to Peck and Group 100 if we were able to build that. And then 400,000 for the other projects that we've got permits for and everything. Oh, okay. But we're waiting for funding from the okay. state. Uh, next. And uh, the Main Street reconstruction um, that we waited so long for replaced the eight inch cast iron pipe that was uh, buried, that was installed in 1890 cent in the hand dug uh, <laughs> trench. And it was in continuous use for 128 years. Uh, we replaced it with a 12 inch pipe, which is gonna enhance fire flows and service. Um, and the trustees back then, and uh, at the suggestion of Tom Nesbitt and things, that uh, the state couldn't prove they owned uh, the right away for the what was the Winooski Turnpike, which is what Route uh, Two is, and the village couldn't prove it. So we click claimed uh, any right away that the village property owners had. Um, that these utilities were in our uh, right away, so that then the uh, state and the federal government paid to replace the utilities, the water, the sewer lines, and uh, the storm drains and things, thus saving us the cost of replacing these. Bill had uh, put in the EFUD report was over $5 million. Uh, pretty close to $5 million in construction costs plus uh, engineering that uh, we saved. And uh, that last improvement pretty much completes uh, the upgrade of all the transmission and distribution system of the water system since 88. Uh, so it, it's uh, in pretty good shape. Uh, thanks, next. Uh, some of the priorities EFUD is working on that we have a 10 inch line from Blush Hill Reservoir that's uh, we'd like to replace. Uh, we're working on uh, restructuring the water rates so that everyone is built on the same basis, business and residential units and things that uh, some of the state rules have changed that got uh, water uh, consumption and things that, different levels. Uh, we are uh, hope to, uh, you know, exchange the uh, ownership of the pipes and hybrids in the Duxbury Moore Sound system. We thought that was going to be more of a project before, but it looks like it's pretty simple with them doing it. Um, we need to work on multiple use regulations for the watershed, the hikers and the bikers and things up in the uh, watershed to protect and uh, we're also looking at options to install a transmission line from Howard Avenue to the development in the area of Cabot, Annex, the East Wind Mobile Home Park, and a new Ivy, Ivy computer building over on uh, uh, Route 100 to give them uh, fire protection and a water supply. The estimated cost keep going up with things today. I think we really thought it was around $2 million now. Um, next. Um, this is showing where that is, that it's a potential leading to water line from uh, Howard Avenue there uh, going out to the area of East Wind uh, Mobile Home Park where there's all the development of uh, the stores. Uh, we talk to people, they're interested in kind of connecting up if we get the water out there. Um, but it is an extensive, expensive expansion, and it's not something we would have the current users shouldn't pay to extend the water line to these. So we were hoping maybe through the uh, grants and things with the uh, ARPA money and stuff that uh, there could be help. Uh, We've applied a couple of times potential grants, I think. Uh, so 
we're in the hoping to come up with some money to do that. Um, the uh, Waterbury Village and EFA residents, I think, hold those 18 night officials and engineers uh, for their good design of this system for the water system and the sources today. We owe uh, the manager, Bill Shuttluck, and former public works to the Alex Dustley, Tom Nesbitt, Bill Woodruff, and the other elected officials for their efforts and decisions in upgrading the current system. Uh, I think this water system is an unnoticed gem of Waterbury that's so important to our future. I think it's one of the best water systems in the state due to its location, the protection of the sources and the generators and the ability to operate in emergencies. I think it's going to serve many generations to follow us. And I'm pleased to have an opportunity to serve my community. Thank Bill Woody for all his help in collecting facts and pictures to put this together. Um, I hope to use it in other times to share information about the Waterbury water system. So uh, next. And over the years, I've served a number of times with uh, commissioners, uh, Bob O'Brien, Chuck Magnus, Bob Fanuc, and Ed Steele was a commissioner for a short while, Mark Albagani, and Cindy Parks, but I'd like to uh, dedicate this presentation to the memory of Bob O'Brien. I don't know how many of you knew him, but he truly loved Waterbury and was proud of serving his community. He uh, died in his sleep in April 1995. And Bill and I have talked a number of times about his, he told everything as it was, uh, wasn't bashful. And if people complained about our water rates, he'd say, tell them to go throw a well. Uh, we heard that many times. Um, and Bob was the first recipient of the Wallace Award posthumously that, uh, you know, he was, uh, he sort of recruited me to be a water commissioner too. And uh, I think we, uh, I owe him a bit of gratitude for his work. I think, you know, he's 80, he was in 88, uh, the water commission, so it's about 70 or so. Thank you for listening and hope you can appreciate when you turn on the faucet uh, next time where it all comes from and uh, the effort that's uh, been put in to keep the system what it is today. Um, I'll do the sewer system at another time, but it's not anywhere near as exciting or as interesting <laughs> as the water system. So. It's the other end of the pipe. Depends on who you ask. Always has given people around into the sewer system. You guys can have this in presentation. Let us know at the running time and we'll discuss a little bit Pete Grolcheck would have been as excited about the yes. sewer system as I am about the water system. So. Yeah. One, goes with, one, so one can't go without the other, right? <laughs> they do, though. <laughs> <laughs> they do. The sewer system is not connected to the water. It's not connected to the water. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There. You're still in the wastewater system. Uh, Great. I'll do that one in a half an hour. Will you just need to sign that or just go? Well, we'll, yeah, I think I'll. Right. Well, well, um, I don't know. On that note, if there are no pressing the questions pattern, about the water presentation, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So you know what happened when you wouldn't.